would like to just briefly introduce our speakers and they can say hello. Kalina Mikowska from the National Institutes of Health, raise your hand. Dr. Luca Lavagnino in the front. Uh, Dr. Niels Friedrich Wagner from Ottawa. Uh, Luca's in Houston. Kalina's in uh, Bethesda. And Professor uh, Adil from uh, Kutztown. Pennsylvania uh, on our session this evening. So uh, we have a three hour time slot until 1030 and I think we'll have plenty of time for discussion and hopefully uh, this technology which has come from Canada, from California and cobbled together a few chords here and there from the Marriott uh, and if the uh, technology gods are with us um, all will be fine and we can also post these sessions on YouTube as we've been wont to do in the last few years. So uh, without further ado, welcome to all of you and I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Kalina Mikowska to please lead us off here. In Thank you very much for having me. I feel like a bit of an outsider. I'm a neuroscientist, um, so I'm really... I. I very much welcome the opportunity to talk to you. And um, when I got invited by Greg and Alan, um, I have to confess that I had to go back and actually read Carl Jaspers. So if some of what I'm saying doesn't um, ring true, please feel free to comment or correct me, or um, we can have a discussion afterwards. So what I'm hoping to show you is um, how we, as neuroscientists, do research on some of the concepts that Carl Jaspers discusses, um, specifically about mental illness, um, categories of mental illness, and I'll show you the way that we approach these kinds of questions um, and some of the conceptual challenges that we face, um, and hopefully you'll have questions for me at the end. So what I'm going to um, talk about specifically is I'm going to show you brain imaging data um, on children, typically developing kids, and kids with aggression. And I'm going to show you how there's dis disassociations in the brain imaging data with self-report and other indices. Um, and the question that I struggle with um, is, so what can, what can neuroscience teach us about these things? Like, what can neuroscience teach us about um, empathy, about categories of mental illness, dimensions of mental illness? Um, so. Just up front, I'm not going to be answering that question. I'm just going to continue posing it. Um, OK. And just my acknowledgments up front, my PhD was at the University of Chicago. Um, and Jean de Cidi was my main advisor. And I had wonderful students. Um, currently, I'm at the NIMH, the National Institute of Mental Health, um, with a very wonderful advisor, Danny Pine. And I'm also affiliated with the University of Maryland in College Park. Okay, so what do I mean by empathy? And when I was preparing the, this slide, and I've, and I've shown this picture before as well at, at other conferences, um, and I think every time I look at it, every time I look at this woman, my heart sort of goes out to her, right? And I think that all of us feel the same way. Um, so there's something like you look at this woman and you can't help but feel distressed or upset. If you don't feel that way, um, give me your email information because I'd like to study you. <laughs> um, but, you know, so that's really the phenomenological experience, looking at her and feeling upset and then wondering, like, well, why is she upset? Is it because she's facing a loss? Maybe she lost her job? Maybe she misses somebody? Um, so the experience is very much something that we can resonate with. Um, and that's the empathic experience that I'd like to capture. As a neuroscientist, how do you how do you quantify that? Like, how do you package that in a way that's objectively um, studyable? So, the broad concept, really, um, and there are many. We can discuss the concept at the end. Is the ability to put oneself in the mind of another person. So, there's a distinction between self and other. Um, you know that it's not your own mind. You have to put yourself in the mind of the other another person. And there are many disagreements on, on the components of this, but generally people agree on two. There's an affective element, so there's one aspect where you just resonate emotionally with the other person, and then the, there's another much more co cognitive, cerebral one. So you have to put your own feelings on hold. So when I look back at that woman who was crying, 
in the moment when I looked at that picture, I wasn't very upset. Like, I might be nervous. I'm not sure how I feel about this going on YouTube. Um, I'm a bit anxious to be here, but I'm not upset. And yet, so I have to put all those feelings, suppress them in a way, in order to feel the way that she does. So there's um, the regulation, and there's also this perspective-taking element. Um, and those are both dissociable. Um, and then there's also the behavior, like what, to, what do you do with this um, empathic feeling? Um, and it's often been linked to things like helping, um, pro-social behavior. This is also a point of discussion, but, um, but that's one other aspect. So how do you measure it? How do you measure these things? Um, and the way, I'm actually trained as a developmental psychologist. So um, neuroscience is one aspect of the, the kinds of things that I look at. But there are many. Um, so we can look at how do kids perceive emotions? I study kids, but uh, the same applies to adults. Um, we can look at self or other report questionnaires. We can look at physiological responses. And we can look at things like brain imaging. And all of these things have, as you can imagine, they have, each, each of them has their weaknesses. You can imagine self-report questionnaires have their weakness. Physiological responses sound like a good idea, but you know whether or not you're excited or distressed, you can't really dissociate that with a physiological measure. Um, and the same goes for neurophysiological, that should say, techniques. Um, and so, Complementary to that, it's it's best if they're complementary to to one another because they balance the limitations of each method. So I'm going to show you some examples of what I mean, um, and I'm going to show you this empathy for pain paradigm that I've been using that others have used um, in the past few years uh, as an index of empathy. And I'm going to show you some differences in um, some sex differences in indices of empathy. Um, but just to be fair, this is not a talk about sex differences, it's just a talk to illustrate how dissociations can occur among different measures with sex differences as, um, as a case in point. So I have these typically developing kids. Um, I'll show you data on these kids. And then I have another study with kids with aggressive conduct problems. And these are clinically diagnosed kids with um, aggressive conduct disorder. And these, so these are samples. There are 65 in the first study and 100 in the second study. And so these are pretty big numbers for, for neuroimaging studies. Um, and you'll see right at the bottom that the approach that I take is a dimensional one. Um, and that is something that the NIMH um, really fosters, and I'll, I'll go into that a little bit. So I don't know if you're familiar with the initiative, but at the NIH, um, one of the main initiatives, which is against um, the commonly, like the DSM criteria, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, is a way of categorizing mental illness. The approach that we take at the NIH is a much more dimensional one. And what that means is that mental illness, the categories they're meaningful in the sense that they establish a common language, and they're meaningful in the sense that um, clinicians can talk to one another. But really, there's a lot of systems that are shared. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of um, underlying circuitry that's very similar across the different categories. So. The research domain criteria focuses on five different systems. So negative valence, like fear, anxiety, um, positive valence, like reward, cognitive systems, attention, things like attention, memory, social processes, like face processing, and then these arousal modulatory systems. And the idea here is that by looking at each of these systems across disorders, you can actually get a lot of information about the biological underpinnings, um, the etiology of the disease. It's not meant to, it's not meant to um, take the place of categorization, but it's certainly meant to complement it in a way that you can learn more about the etiology of the disease. So the one that I'll be focusing on here is the social processes. And the idea is that um, there's an automatic response. So when you see that hand touching the flame, automatically you activate the same systems in yourself as if you yourself were touching the flame. So if when you, just by observing that hand on the red flame, you can see the same exact uh, neural systems activated. I'll show you some images. Um, 
that demonstrate that. It's a really good tool. There are problems with this as well, but it's a really good tool to investigate empathy because it's such a common experience that we all share. So not to get too technical, but um, the best evidence for this was from monkey recordings. And so they looked at this one area that you can see right there. That's the anterior cingulate. That's one of, one of the areas that's activated. And um, what they did is they um, put a monkey's finger into freezing cold water and looked at the ACC activation. Um, right here. So this is like single cell recordings. And you can see, you can see the activity here. Here, the monkey was just watching. Um, <coughs> There was, it was watching somebody else, another monkey, receiving um, painful stimuli. So, and that was in the single cell recording in that region. So basically, I think that's very nice evidence showing that um, there's some overlap between um, observation of painful stimuli and experience of painful stimuli. Um, and since that time, People have moved on um, and done similar work in humans. Obviously, you can't do single cell recordings from humans. Um, so this, you know, so this is a this is like the shared representations framework. Um, but to be, you know, to be clear, I don't think that it's just this automatic mechanism. Like we don't go around feeling pain just by looking at people, you know, knocking their elbows onto the handle and things like that. So we're not um, just randomly um, sharing pain. So there's top-down control, there's things like attention, motivation, there's certainly in-group and out-group phenomena. Um, we're more likely to feel empathy for somebody who's in our in-group than somebody who's in our out-group. Um, there are definitely personality traits that I'll discuss, the situation. So all of these things are important and it's not just a sharing thing. Um, so these are some of the stimuli that I show um, to kids in the scanner. And these are just animated clips. So they're lying in the, in the fMRI scanner and they see something like this. This happens to be an accidental harm scenario. Um, you'll see that I don't show the faces and that's just because I don't want the kids to focus on the facial expression of the face. Um, but other people show facial expressions, these ones don't. So this is one example. So this is an accidental harm. And then this one is an intentional harm. So there's multiple of these scenarios. Um, and <laughs> you can see that this looks quite painful. Um, so I have the kids in the scanner, and they're watching the movies right over here. <laughs> and I look to see like how are they responding. Accidental versus intentional harm happens to be really important as well. I'm going to get into that in a second, but it matters for, uh, for things like aggression. So these are examples of the kinds of things that kids see in the scanner. And adults too, but I'm going to mostly focus on kids. And just to summarize, quite a large literature um, in the past um, 10 years, I'd say, maybe 7 to 10 years, what you see is when you see these painful scenarios contrasted with non-painful scenarios that I didn't show here, you see networks, brain networks that are activated in sensory process, interoceptive awareness, and evaluation. So these are all sensory processing regions. You know that it's not your finger. You know that it's not your um, groin area. And yet, like, you have these sensory, um, sensory regions, pain transmission, defensive movement. Um, all of these are engaged just by the observation of somebody else in pain. Um, it also matters if the pain is intentional versus accidental. So that's something I, I sort of thought about when I was on the train station and I just got, you know, somebody just pushed me and mm. I was about to like get hurt, like I was about to get mad and then they, they, they said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry. And the second they said, I'm really sorry, <laughs> it sort of, I don't know, I felt um, that it wasn't as painful anymore. So I decided uh, it might be, might be a good thing to look at. Um, and so, when you're being intentionally hurt, there's additional regions engaged as well. Um, so that's really interesting. You mm -hmm. see um, regions that are um, involved in emotion regulation um, and then perspective taking, mental state inference. So you do see a difference between these intentional and accidental actions. Um, so here, all this shows, um, this is one of the regions that's involved in um, emotional salience, amygdala, um, and you see that that's very much engaged in intentional harm. So the amygdala is 
involved primarily in emotionally salient situations. A lot of people talk about it um, in terms of negative emotions, fear, um, but it's also involved in like very positive emotional situations. Um, and you see that there's a difference. Um, so this is the, the activity that you see is just a difference between intentional and accidental harm. And the graph, what the graph shows you is that there are age-related changes over time, um, which may or may not be surprising to you, so that with age, um, this activity declines. Um, and what I wanted to, um, when I was looking at these sex, the, these age differences, um, one of the things that I wanted to look at is like, well, you know, are there sex differences in the sympathic responding? Um, I had a big sample. I thought it might be an interesting thing to look at. I wasn't necessarily looking at sex differences. Um, so I wanted to see, like, are there sex differences in this response? And what you'll see here is um, with age, so this is in with increasing age, the blue line is boys. So here you'll see boys are asked, how bad do you feel for the person who was hurt? How sad do you feel for the person that was hurt? With increasing age, the boys just say, eh, you know, I'm not that sad. Like, I'm not, not, not really that upset. And the girls with age, they increase their empathic response. So what they're reporting is they're reporting more and more empathy. I'm more sad, I'm, I'm more upset. Um, and this is what they say. Then if you look at the brain response, this is in one of the regions that I showed you earlier. Um, it's sort of like a proprioceptive sort of response. If you look at the brain regions, basically, I mean, there's just not any difference. There's no difference at all in the brain response. If you look at, I also looked at um, pupil dilation, which is a measure of um, autonomic arousal. So I looked at um, whether it matters if, an, if it's an intentional action, where do they look, how aroused are they. Um, and the take home really is that it matters if it's intentional. Um, they look longer, they, their, their pupils dilate more, they have higher autonomic arousal, but there's no difference, there's no sex difference at all in autonomic arousal. So we see here that out of these three measures, two of them say that there's really no sex difference at all. Um, no differences in the brain, no differences in the autonomic response, um, but there is a difference in the way that they report. There's a difference in the way that the kids report on their experience. So now what? So what do you do? You have these inconsistent responses, and I think it matters, and maybe you're gonna talk about it in psychiatry, like in psychiatry, like what you go on what your patient tells you, right? If they tell you, I feel empathy, or I feel distress, or I feel fear, that's what, you have to go on that, right? I mean, um, but at the same time, these measures are not really measuring the same thing. And so you have to sort of grapple with that. Um, so it might be that they index separate aspects of, a, of an individual's response to distress. Um, and you, it, as a researcher and as a clinician, you just have to think about, like, which one are you using as a criterion measure? And if you're not using one and you're using some kind of confluence of data, well, what does that look like? Um, and I think that's an important thing in, in this classification versus dimensional approach to, to mental illness. Um, so I'm going to show you now the next study, which is um, on aggressive kids. And the idea here is, and I've outlined that in this paper that I'll hand out to you. Um, the idea is that humans, this is something that, this is a hypothesis that is put forward by um, James Blair, who's written a lot about this in psychopathy. He um, happens to be in the office next to mine, so <laughs> I try to get his ideas through osmosis. Mm -hmm. But um, so the thought is that humans are predisposed to find other people's distress aversive, and they're punished by signals of other sadness. So when you see somebody in distress, it's really, um, it's really distressing and aversive and you don't like it. Um, and so the idea is that you're just less likely to engage in these actions that give rise to other people's distress and more likely to engage in actions that alleviate others' discomfort. Um, so it's sort of like a violence inhibition mechanism, like just because it's aversive and distressive, distressing. Um, and so again, just returning briefly to this, um, to this idea of sex differences without really focusing on sex differences, but trying to look at like what these measures are doing. One of the things I don't even have to, you know, tell you that, um, this, 
I don't even have to show you this graph. Um, it's very well known that males are much, much more aggressive than females. Um, this is rate of, I think this is rate of violent crime per thousand population. It, on the y-axis, it could really be anything. Um, uh, violent crime, physical aggression, all, uh, incarceration rates, and the rate is much higher in males than females. But what you'll notice is that um, it doesn't start out different. It starts out, in terms of aggressive behavior, males and females start out the same, and then they diverge around adolescence. So the interesting question is like, well, what happens around that period? Like, what happens um, right around that time? Um, before testosterone, testosterone for sure, <laughs> um, but then you know that's yeah. There's definitely testosterone, <laughs> but how does that impact the way that they're seeing emotions, or how does that, how does that look like? Um, so in this study, we had um, kids with aggressive conduct disorder, and um, what I wanted to look at is well, are there sex differences here too in these correlations between conduct disorder? I'm going to tell you about what that is um, with these variations in the brain. And I looked at function and structure in brain. So conduct disorder is a clinical diagnosis. It's in the DSM. Um, and basically, it's if you have more than 12 months of repeated violation of rules, norms, and rights of others. And there are different categories here. There are aggression to people and animals, destruction of property, deceitfulness, serious violation of rules. So it's not like a kid stealing your lunch. This is a kid stabbing your cat um, sort of thing. Um, and now with the new um, diagnostic criteria, there's this additional callous unemotional specifier. So this actually, the definition here is lack of empathy. So there's this additional specifier that, that seems to be really important for these kids and that um, might set these kids apart from the other kinds of kids. Um, so basically here we have um, 54 kids with conduct disorder symptoms and 56 um, controls. and. What I'd like to point out is the analyses that I did, I first looked at group analyses, just pitting one group against the other. Um, and I really didn't see anything there. So just by looking at that, like just looking at the two groups. But then when I looked at these symptoms dimensionally, the way that our doc suggests, um, I found there's a lot more there if you do it that way. So the first thing that I'll show you is um, in terms of autonomic arousal, and this is pupil dilation. So one thing that's pretty cool that you can do is um, when these kids are watching the stimuli of, of various people kicking each other, you can also look at the way that their pupils dilate. Um, so that's what I showed you earlier. And what you see here is that on the x-axis, with increasing aggression, so with increasing aggression symptoms, um, the girls now are going down. So the more, the more aggressive she is, the less, the more she looks like a psychopathic individual because her autonomic responses are just going down and down and down. The boys, on the other hand, look very different. So the boys, with increasing aggression, they just get more and more um, aroused, as indexed with, with pupil dilation here. So for brain, I'm going to show you brain structure first. Essentially, um, these are all areas that are involved in this empathic response that I showed you earlier. Um, and what I want to highlight is this. So here, what you see here, this, the STS is, in, um, is involved in mentalizing and perspective taking. So this is a pretty large group of kids, 110 kids. And you see that um, with increasing aggressive symptoms, they have a decrease in that region. Um, so then I thought, well, okay, what if you break this down now in terms of males and females? So if you look at the girls, that um, relationship holds. Um, with increasing aggression, there's less volume in that region. With boys, there's no association at all. Um, and so the whole effect here looks like it's driven by the girls, and this is just like some stats. Um, I can... Yeah, this is just to, to show you that this is pretty stringent criteria. Um, it's all corrected, and it, it's pretty, it holds up to all kinds of multiple comparison testing um, that people usually criticize us for. Um, and so with the fMRI findings, we replicate, first of all, previous research showing that the task activates the same regions that we found before. 
Um, and then here, I looked at sex differences again, um, and basically in these regions, the SDS again, the mentalizing component, um, you see that there's less activation in the females. So the effect here again is driven by the females um, with conduct disorder. So trying to make sense of all of this, um, we see that in the autonomic responses, the females are the ones with a lower response. They're the ones who are less and less um, responsive to, to, to aggression. Um, with pupil dilation, you see this negative association for females. In brain structure, you see a negative association for females. In brain function, you see a negative association for females. Um, and you know, putting these two things together and thinking about like the concepts of empathy and the concepts of mental illness, when, you, when we think back to the first study, when kids without these symptoms, there's really no difference in their brain response, in their autonomic response, in their reactivity to distress. But then when we look at like with increasing symptoms, like without looking at categories, but with looking at like dimensionally across these aggressive symptoms, they begin to diverge sharply. They begin to diverge in all of these like autonomic arousal, brain structure, and brain function. Um, and one way to think about this, and one way that I think that um, neuroscience can be helpful, um, because their behavior is very similar. They're not different in their behavioral response. They're not different in their clinical symptoms. Um, and yet, like, the neurobiological uh, markers are different. And so one of the ways in which we can think about it, possibly there are others, but this is one, um, is this idea of this gender paradox. Um, and this is, you know, this is an old idea from criminology, but you know, we can apply it maybe to, to mental illness too, that the the gender that's least that's the gender where the mental illness is less frequent. So Women are much less likely to be aggressive. They're much um, un they're underrepresented in these like aggressive uh, clinical cases. The gender that's less of, that's that's where the mental illness is less frequent. It's also more severe. So the idea is that as a female, you're socialized to be helpful. You're socialized to be friendly. You're socialized to be um, prosocial. And if you're a boy, you know you're a little bit aggressive and you get away with it a lot more. So if as a female you're socialized in this way and you still show this behavior, then there must be something biologically, there's a, there's a much higher threshold that you have to pass. And so you must, you, the, the idea is that you have to be um, biologically more stressed. And we see that in the data. Like we see that the, that the weight of the biological um, vulnerability is carried by the females. Um, so that's just one idea. Um, and then we have to think about the developmental context, like the gender roles, gender expectations. Um, you know, it's not exactly clear what it means to, to have an under, under aroused system or, unresp or unresponsive system. Maybe it's something that you're controlling too much, uh, maybe you're regulating too much. So it's not exactly clear like what it's representing. Um, you know, in the sample, we can generalize to, to different samples. Um, yeah. This is the data that I have. Um, thank you. And I'm glad to discuss anything um, that stands out. Thank you very much. And I'd like, if I may please, to invite um, Dr. Niels uh, Friedrich Wagner and Dr. Luca Lavagnino to the table. Introduce um, Dr. Luca Lavagnino, who is from the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston, and Dr. Niels Friedrich Wagner from the University of Ottawa, Canada. And they're kind of doing a joint presentation for us this evening. Thank you. So we'll have two parts to this presentation. The first is a more conceptual uh, part, uh, defi better defining the concepts uh, uh, that uh, are involved uh, in uh, what we will we'll be talking about. And the second part is more focused uh, on, uh, uh, on uh, psychiatry, particularly and on the implications of uh, these topics for psychiatry. So uh, the, the, the first part of, of, of this presentation will be, uh, will be done by uh, Dr. Wagner. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about first and third person ontology <coughs> and um, about recent developments in philosophy of, of mind that may be um, pertinent to Karl Jaspers ideas of erklären and verstehen. Um, so I'm going to very briefly introduce some issues, some key issues of the mind-body problem, which is uh, one of the most controversial discussed uh, topics in philosophy of mind these days. So essentially the question is what is the relationship between mind and brain, uh, between mind and body, or if you want to construe it more broadly then you could also ask the question so what are mental, what distinguishes mental properties from physical properties. And um, so why does this problem arise? Why is that particularly difficult to answer in humans? I mean, for what it's worth, humans have both physical properties like size, weight, or shape, and at the same time also mental properties, so what we already have discussed before, like perceptual experiences, phenomenological um, feelings from a first-person perspective, things that cannot be immediately translated into observable, uh, observable third-person um, properties. So the idea is what one of the, or one of the things is that distinguishes physical properties from mental properties is that physical properties seem to be public and by public I mean they are observable, they are describable in more or less objective terms whereas mental properties are to a certain extent private at least that is to say we don't have an access to and that we don't have a direct access to what other people think or feel. So um, this has been discussed mainly but not obviously not exclusively by, by Thomas Nagel, <coughs> who um, wrote an interesting paper entitled Subjectivity, or the Subject and Obje ob Objectivity. Uh, and what he states at the outset is that there is a tendency to, uh, to assert that the only way of describing things as they really are is by seeking an objective account of their existence. So that is to say that objectivity in this sense is uh, some kind of a hallmark of reality. And you see this picture here where two two kids uh, objectively uh, can objectively agree upon the fact that they are two oranges or whatever it may be. So, um, but on the other hand, if you have a um, subjective, I mean, as Nagel says here, I'm quoting, uh, but often what appears to have a more subjective point of view cannot be accounted for in this way. So either the objective conception of the world is incomplete or the subjective involves illusions that should be rejected. So. The idea is, of course, if we see this picture here and uh, people or kids discuss or, or have different attitudes as to how this cake tastes, then this is an objective problem and not cannot be described in objective terms, at least not uh, in the same way. So, and um, these considerations seem to resonate with uh, Jasper's concern that, um, quoting again, that tacit assumptions are made that, like everything else biological, the actual reality of human existence is, som is a somatic event. So man is only comprehensible when, is, when he is understood in somatic terms. I mean, this is obviously not Jasper's view, but this is what, what the problem Jasper poses in the general, in the introduction to the general psychopathology. And Nagel makes a similar, or makes a claim which resonates to that too in, in saying that, so when we flee the subjective under the pressure of an assumption that everything must be something, not to any point of view, but in itself, then we can see that um, the idea that we cannot flee the subjective in a way that we want to translate it to an objective, describable third-person account. So now I'm going to turn to uh, to ask to give some very brief sketches as to how those problems have been tackled in recent philosophy of mind. Obviously, it has to be somehow idiosyncratic because there are so many different theories out there. So for one extreme, that would be the identity uh, theory, which holds that just mental states and processes are identical to brain states and processes. That would be some kind of a brute physicalism, saying that um, there's, it's not merely a correlate between mental states and brain states, but brain states or mental states can be totally reducible, totally reduced to, um, to um, mental states. No, the other way around. Mental states can be totally reduced to, to brain states. And one of the most popular recent views uh, in cognitive science is uh, functionalism. So that would be the slogan would be that the mind is what the brain does. So I want to sketch a little uh, contrast to that, which um, 
later will be then uh, elaborated that that could be some kind of a an idea as to how to bring together recent philosophy of mind with the uh, Jasper's idea of um, erklären and verstehen. So um, when we talk about, when we think about consciousness, or what, what consciousness is, <coughs> and um, about the idea how to bring those mental and physical properties together, then on the one hand, we what we know about consciousness is what we know from our own experience, so from phenomen phenomenological third person, first person uh, accounts. And on the other hand is what we also heard in the earlier presentation is what we know about brain functions. So one of the main biggest problems is then how can those two spheres be reconciled? The idea of biological naturalism is then, it's a goes back to well, it's John Searle's idea. He um, introduced the, the ideas of third and first person ontology. So if you see this tree here on this picture, then um, there's, ob there's, ob there's a first person, there's a third person ontological account to that, and objective, this tree has objective features. So th th those objective features do not depend on any observer. They are just there. Right? This tree has a certain height and a certain uh, amount of leaves and whatnot. So the idea is that a third person ontology is objective in the sense that it describes observer independent brute facts that have that have that have their own standalone um that are standalone entities so they don't depend on anything else than on their features. So but whereas on the other hand the first person ontology to this tree would then would then be a subjective viewpoint. It would be dependent on first person observations. So the particular way in which you see the tree, in which you see those uh, green leaves, and if you find them beautiful, or you know the way you deceive it. Um, so yeah, it's been said the first person ontology is subjective, and it depends on is an observer dependent qualitative features that are experienced by a subject. And now the idea related to consciousness is then first and third person ontology. As a, so consciousness has both third and first person ontological features, but either of them, and this is the important part, belong to the natural world. So there's no spooky uh, thing, physics or anything else involved here. It's just the idea that um, they are two, they belong, they are not distinct metaphysical categories, but they both belong to one cohesive picture, that's the natural world. So this is the disclaimer here that there's no uh, dualism or involved. Um, so the general idea of emergentism here in, in biological naturalism is then that mental features are realized by physical features, but their first person ontological subjective account is not reducible to those lower level brain processes that um, that realize or give rise to the um, to the uh, subjective experience. Um, so I quote, quote Searle here, he says that consciousness is ontologically subjective in the sense that it only that it only exists when an experience when experienced by a human or animal subject it is important to emphasize that you can have epistemically objective knowledge of a domain that is ontologically subjective it is for this reason that an epistem that an epistemically objective science of ontologically subjective consciousness is possible so uh, Thomas Nagel says on a similar note that mental concepts in this regard are sui generis so they are and that it requires the, the willingness to contemplate the idea of a single natural phenomenon um, that is in itself and necessarily both subjectively mental from the inside and objectively physical from the outside, just as we are, says Nagel. And this seems to resonate very well with Karl Jasper's idea of the human being as a whole. And that was my little part, so I'm going to turn it to Luca now and we change the seats. Okay, I will uh, approach uh, these topics from more from a, uh, from the point of view of psychiatric research. So, uh, this is an example of an abstract of a recent paper paper in a neuroimaging. Uh, you will notice that uh, uh, in the beginning of this abstract, uh, we see, despite extensive research, psychiatry remains an essentially clinical and therefore subjective discipline with no objective biomarkers to guide clinical practice and research. Developmental uh, development of psychiatric biomarkers is consequently important, and then uh, will follow a description of uh, this uh, uh, new method of data analysis. 
from this uh, uh, be beginning of, of this uh, of this work, one thing that certainly stands out uh, is that uh, the subjective nature of mental phenomena is seen as a, a, a limit that will somehow be overcome by a more sensitive or by a more accurate uh, uh, analytic techniques. And uh, this is probably uh, a case uh, of uh, a, a more general problem that uh, uh, Nagel uh, noted uh, that, that emerges in many different contexts as uh, has been uh, uh, discussed. But can mental phenomena be reduced to objective phenomena? Should psychiatry as a science pursue that aim? And uh, how to integrate in psychiatric knowledge aspects that are epistemologically so heterogeneous? Uh, this is a problem that uh, is not uh, uh, new. Actually, it was a problem that was very much there when Jaspers was, uh, was, uh, uh, started his career as, as a psychiatrist, and he felt that the need for a conceptual clarification and took this task upon himself. Uh, Klach and, and Verstein uh, and the distinction between the, 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 the two is an influential attempt to give a foundation to psychiatry as a, as a science. And uh, as, a, uh, uh, as you know, uh, explanation requires repeated experience, collecting examples, and consists of creating theories that have a general validity, while understanding refers to our ability to grasp meaningful connections. And it is not a form of mechanical knowledge that can be generalized, but uh, in understanding uh, a fresh personal intuition is needed on every occasion, as uh, Jasper writes in the general psychopathology. So, so the, a question that emerges is which relationship exists between the two? In order to understand this, uh, a, a, a good place to, to start is probably in the part of the general psychopathology where uh, Jasper uh, talks about uh, the localization of brain functions. And here's a description of uh, uh, how Jasper represents uh, the uh, approach of Theodore Meinert, uh, a biologically oriented psychiatrist. The structure of the psyche and the structure of the mind of the, of, of the brain must coincide. Uh, Jaspers adds, uh, uh, this postulate has never been proved. It cannot be proved because it is meaningless. What is heterogeneous cannot coincide, but at best, one can be used as a metaphorical expression of the other. Uh, I think it's even probably more illuminating from a certain point of view, uh, this other passage where, where uh, Jaspers uh, uses a, 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 an interesting analogy. He says that the situation is analogous with the exploration of an unknown continent from opposite directions where the explorers never meet because of the impenetrable country that intervenes. So uh, I, 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 I wanted to represent it with this, uh, with this image of a jungle with a, a, a river uh, that divides the landscape in two parts. So we have an impenetrable country which separates our understanding of psychic events from our explanation of somatic events. And there seems to be no common ground. But uh, psychiatric practice uh, in some way uh, forces us to, 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 to change our perspective. Uh, in, in which way? We can imagine uh, an everyday uh, uh, situation in which uh, uh, we immerse ourselves uh, in the uh, uh, internal experience as another person uh, is uh, telling that internal experience to us, and we are grasping the meaningful connections between uh, the, uh, the, the, the ideas and the thoughts of, of this person. Uh, Consider then this situation. A person tells us that a car passing in front of his house is a sign that an organized plan to harm him is being put into action by his enemies. Another example, uh, another person has an intuition that a, that a title of a newspaper uh, that he sees on a newspaper is a coded message for him from God. And th this actually is what happens to uh, John Nash in, in, uh, in A Beautiful Mind. So in these cases, what uh, uh, Jaspers would have called our genetic understanding, the, our perception of meaningful connections between ideas, is subject to important limitations. We cannot achieve an intuition of how these thoughts arise from each other. Uh, the car uh, to the idea of the conspiracy, uh, the title of the newspaper, and the idea of the message from God. However, we can make attempts at providing an explanation. For example, some change in the physiology of the brain might account for this phenomena, or intervening on brain function, for example, with drugs, could affect this phenomenon. Uh, we can see here that the two polarities of psychiatric knowledge assist us in different moments of psychiatric practice. However, this requires a shift in our perspective. We started from uh, psychic contents, which have a private dimension and a subjective quality. And uh, we are now considering natural phenomena, which are never seen from within, but from the outside only, as we have seen in the previous presenta presentation uh, about the, the work of John Searle that, con that 
commented extensively on this irreducibility of first-person phenomena to third-person phenomena. So the question is, what should psychiatry make of this? Can psychiatry accommodate its different ways of knowing into a unified framework? So what has happened uh, so far I, I, I will go uh, uh, very uh, briefly on this since uh, it has been uh, very uh, well uh, described in the, in the, in the first uh, in the first presentation. Uh, Biological psychiatry so far has been based on the DSM. The, the underlying assumption of the DSM is there are mental disorders that are conceptualized as discrete categories. This continues from each other and from health. And that intense efforts have been mobilized to find the neurobiological correlates of this diagnosis. Uh, it hasn't worked probably so well. That's what the, the, the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, uh, Thomas Insel, uh, said uh, a, a couple of years ago, or, or perhaps three. So this new uh, research framework, uh, the research domain criteria, have, has been uh, proposed. And uh, it, uh, again, it has been uh, very well described. So I, I will just uh, touch briefly on the fact that in, he, in this framework, psychopathology is conceptualized as composed of, con of continu uh, continuous dimensions that cut across discrete diagnosis. So how has this new framework uh, been, uh, um, been considered by uh, researchers uh, uh, in uh, the philosophy of psychiatry? Uh, some of these researchers are, uh, have considered this uh, positively, as we see in this uh, uh, paper by Falford and uh, uh, his collaborators. They say that the RDOC framework uh, um, provides a more inclusive framework that is hospitable to a plurality of research paradigms. However, other observers were less enthusiastic. And uh, in particular, I think it's, it's uh, uh, interesting was to consider the views of uh, Joseph Parnas and uh, uh, Basically, uh, he uh, underlies uh, how under the uh, proposed difference of this approach uh, compared to the DSM diagnosis, the differences uh, in his view are not so deep. Uh, and the reason is that this research, research program, in his view, could be said to endorse a type-type identity reductionism, where certain parts of mental life are reduced to certain kinds of neural activity. And Parnas says uh, the fact that uh, we define uh, in, in, in a different way uh, the mental phenomena doesn't make a real difference. What the, the operation that we are doing is basically the same. And Parnas concludes this comment, pointing out the risk of a psychiatry without psyche, which is a term that he borrows from Jaspers. At this point, I think it's important to uh, emphasize the fact that Carly Aspers was, was never dismissive of uh, research in neuroscience or biological psychiatry. In fact, he was very impressed by the achievements of uh, uh, psychiatrist uh, uh, researchers that were his, uh, uh, that, that were his uh, mentors when he was training, for example, Nissel. Uh, and uh, so at this point, we could ask ourselves, what new perspective can uh, modern neuroscience offer to problems that Jaspers considered? Uh, to answer the question, uh, I think it, it's interesting to go back uh, uh, to how Jaspers elaborates on the specific mode of function uh, of uh, understanding. Uh, Jaspers says that there are two ways of understanding how psychic events arise out of other psychic events. One is the use of logic, thus understanding connections rationally, and the other is empathy. And uh, Jaspers uh, uh, emphasizes in different parts, uh, uh, both of the general psychopathology and uh, in a 1913 uh, paper on uh, uh, the diagnosis of uh, uh, psychosis, that uh, where, whereas the rational understanding is only an aid to psychology, empathic understanding is psychology itself. Empathy is at the heart of psychological understanding. It is the mode of understanding which is specific to psychology. Uh, Obviously, em empathy is extremely uh, relevant uh, in uh, uh, human contact uh, in, in, in general, so in, in diagnosis, it, 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 it is extremely relevant in treatment, too. Uh, in, in this, neuroscience can offer recent contributions in this regard, and uh, I will uh, uh, definitely skip uh, the, the, the next uh, parts because uh, the studies on empathy have been uh, uh, very well described. Uh, these are uh, the different brain regions that, that, are, that are supposed to be uh, active in, in different tasks uh, that, that uh, express different aspects of empathy. What I wanted to, uh, to um, call your attention on is that these studies are about brain processes, obviously. And uh, these processes don't translate in a one-to-one -one fashion to mental uh, phenomena. But they are conditions that have to be present for mental phenomena to happen. Uh, to, uh, 
try to uh, elaborate on, uh, on that. I think it can be useful, the, this passage of the general psychopathology where Jasper says, we know that in general no psychic event uh, exists without the precondition of some physical basis. There are no ghosts. But we do not know a single physical event in the brain which could be considered the identical counterpart of any morbid psychic event. We only know conditioning factors for the psychic life. We never know the cause of the psychic event, only a cause. This passage, I, I think, suggests us that it seems uh, uh, in principle possible to approach investigations of brain activity as a conditioning factor without necessarily attempting to translate mental phenomena into biological facts. So coming back to the new uh, proposals for uh, the, the, the aspects of uh, uh, classification and the biological study in psychiatry, uh, I, I think uh, 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 suggestions uh, could be that uh, the RDOC uh, will offer an improvement in psychiatric research if their application will be guided by methodological awareness and by respecting the boundaries of the validity of the different approaches that we have to use in psychiatry. They can be a good guide for the study of neuroscience, but considering them a new paradigm for psychiatry as a whole would probably be dangerous and could lead to the same limitations that became evident in DSM-based research. Uh, so I think that Jasper's messages like the constant call for methodological pluralism and for opposing approaches that portray the neuroscientific research as the sole dominating paradigm should guide us in shaping the future of psychiatric research. Uh, I would like to end uh, on, on this, uh, 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 on, on this uh, uh, quote from the General Psychopathology uh, in which Jasper says that the psychiatrist as a practitioner deals with individuals, that is to say with the human being as a whole. It is a concept uh, on which uh, uh, Jaspers uh, elaborates uh, in, in the, uh, extensively in the last part of the general psychopathology, and I think it's a, a central message for the practice of psychiatry. Uh, the true explorers are perhaps meant to never meet, but maybe that is the price that we have to pay for considering the object of our study to be man as a whole, as opposed to a brain circuit. Thank you very much. comments, clarifications, please. I'm not really quite sure whether the identity thesis is in keeping with what Jaspers is talking about, because he seems to be keeping somewhat of a duality. And when you're thinking of the identity thesis, I'm thinking of J.J.C. Smart, where he says, um, when a person makes a claim, a first person report, I am in pain. All right. The behaviorist psychologists claim that that's not really a genuine report because it's something that cannot be completely reducible in overt behavior. But J.J.C. Smart thinks it is a genuine report, but it has to be translated into a statement, say a neuroscience statement, such as when I say I am in pain, I'm really saying it's nothing but my C fibers and my brain are firing. And he wants to go as far as to eliminate ordinary language or first person reports and put it into re statements of science. So I, I don't see how Jaspers would be friendly with something like the identity thesis. Uh, that uh, uh, is uh, uh, exactly the kind of view that uh, Jaspers was reacting against because it was the prevalent view in the psychiatric establishment where he was trained. Uh, like, for example, the, the, uh, how he represented the views of, uh, uh, of Meinert uh, uh, is, is very indicative in, in that. Uh, and, uh, uh, or, for example, the, the, uh, the uh, famous sentence by uh, Wilhelm Griesinger that, uh, uh, that the, uh, the uh, mental illnesses are, are illnesses of, of the brain. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, and what I wanted to express, and, and perhaps that there was a misunderstanding there, was that uh, uh, Jaspers was uh, offering an alternative, definitely an alternative view, a, a, a view that wasn't uh, the negation of uh, uh, one of the two aspects, uh, uh, but that uh, uh, was meant to uh, uh, utilize using a pluralism of methods uh, to uh, keep con con considering uh, both as uh, the road that psychiatry would have to follow. I guess I have a, a, a question about um, how any of these methods um, of diagnosis and study 
uh, would account for the difference between a simple stimulus response that would be very mechanistic, uh, you know, I have an impulse and I act on it, and uh, what I think Jasper would be, would be sympathetic with, which is, well, now there's another step to take. I need to see what are my alternatives of action and how do I make selections or elections uh, on, on that basis. And I'm wondering what's the state of the science in looking at questions like that and what are your own thoughts? I would say that uh, uh, my thought uh, is uh, that I think that these problems uh, uh, have need uh, a constant uh, uh, conceptual reflection because I think that uh, the way uh, we address uh, uh, a problem in 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 uh, in psychopathology and I think this is one of the strong messages that, that uh, Jaspers uh, uh, gives uh, is a. Uh, uh, very d d importantly to be decided uh, uh, depending on uh, uh, the situation we're in and, 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 and depending on uh, the uh, pr practical purpose that, that, that it serves. Like, uh, for example, uh, the, 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 the shift in, 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 in the approach uh, when uh, we are confronted with different uh, mental, mental phenomena is uh, uh, an example of that. So I think that uh, uh, it, it would be difficult to, uh, to give a, 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 like a, a, a general uh, answer that that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, includes uh, psychiatry as a, as a whole. I think that, uh, that, that the important message would be that uh, uh, probably for uh, in, in different uh, situations, either in clinical uh, work or in, 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 in research, uh, it is uh, uh, needed uh, a strong commitment for conceptual clarification that is specific to the task at hand. I think that actually uh, Jaspers' orientation is much more radical than supervenience theory or even pro property dualism or, or many of the theories that are now being proposed in consciousness studies. And I, I'd just like to give you an example uh, from his treatment of the human drives he talks about not only physical drives but vital drives that really have no relationship with any particular physical system like the, the drive for power or the will, the will to power or the will to submit something of this sort and then he, he speaks about a, a, another class of drives and he considers this part of his scientific treatment of the human being the spiritual drives the the you know the drive for knowledge meaning which he really classifies as ultimately a, the 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 desire for immortality mm -hmm. and and when he ad addresses the human being as a whole in part 6 um he says we've now come to the end of science and now we're going to we're really discussing philosophy now uh, but it's important for psychopathology because he's, he feels that the psychiatrist should be addressing the patient as a whole even though he will never know that patient as a whole. The, the patient as a whole is always unknowable and yet you, you must somehow address the patient as a whole, which uh, is a, a sort of a, an odd situation to be in. But I just wanted to also um, clarify one other thing. I think there are psychiatric treatments and psychological treatments that do not address the patient as a whole and, and are quite valid. For example, desensitization techniques for phobias and, you know, certain types of medications that, you know, you give your patients. Um, so I, I don't think Yasmus was opposed to that. I, I just, I just think that he 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 th saw those as partial, partial solutions, uh, uh, partial treatments. Thank you for for uh, for your your intervention. I would definitely agree with with the, with the, with what you just said. Both uh, both. Uh, uh, both the, the, the themes that, that, that you just uh, that you just exposed. So, can I ask you a question, follow up? so then, as a psychiatrist, if that 
what if those two things are in conflict? Like, what if the patient tells you one thing, and you look at their brain response, and it tells you something else? Like, what? How do you treat them? Uh, again, I would say that uh, uh, it's uh, very much dependent uh, on the on the context, and I think that uh, uh, trying to think of uh, one of the two as uh, uh, the main uh, way to go in general uh, is probably something that I would not uh, recommend. That's uh, why I, I would uh, shy away from answering that, 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 that kind of question because I think that uh, this way of answering the question is either or is a, a, could be in some instances part of, of, uh, of uh, part of the problem. And I think that the uh, solutions are not uh, uh, are not uh, general. And as has been uh, uh, remarked, uh, there are uh, solutions that, that uh, could could uh, uh, utilize uh, more one or or, or the other uh, approach. But I think it's a, it's a uh, um, it's a problem that has been decided from, from, from case to case. I want to be sure that I understood correctly. You said that our mind also could belong to the natural world. Is it correct? Yeah. And then what we name natural world, brain, belongs to natural world and mind belongs to natural world. So it two parts of the same. Then how they these two parts different? What constitutes their difference? I mean one way to answering this question would be to say that as has been said before, that for example describing pain as phi C fiber firings would be to describe the same phenomenon in two different ways. So it would not necessarily, it does not mean that the, the description of pain as a subjective phenomenological experience need be, if it, if it gets described into another level uh, of neuronal processes or need to be a different kind in itself. It could still be belong to the same cohesive picture to the same natural world in a sense. But that, that does also at the same time not mean that anything that it's entirely reducible to one. So it does not mean that we have to get rid, so to speak, of the subjective and phenomenological experience. It just tries to mean to give a more, um, to give a, to use modern techniques to get us a grip of how that might be represented in the brain. And then again, also, it's not necessarily, I mean, it cannot be excluded totally, logically, certainly not, that um, brain, that phenomenal states are actually not caused by brain states. It cannot be excluded. But it seems to be not a lot of evidence for that it is the case, right? So I think we it's basically an inference to the best explanation, I would say. So uh, it's... What is natural world? I mean, everything that can somehow be observed and described in, in terms that we have empirical access to, right? So nothing that is by itself indescribable in natural terms. So if we would assume, for example, that the soul is an immaterial substance and it can, by definition, not be described in empirical terms, then that would not belong to the natural Personal world. Well, uh, in, in, uh, in, in saying that, I, I think I, I re recapitulate the, the, the last part of, of my presentation. I think that uh, uh, this uh, uh, approach can be uh, certainly a good, a productive approach uh, for and a good agenda for uh, neurosciences. And for example, in the first presentation, we have seen uh, an, an example where uh, certain insights on how the brain works have been possible because this, this approach has been used, they would not have been possible in, uh, in using uh, diagnosis. However, I think that uh, it's uh, in very in important to uh, bear in mind that, that uh, this should not uh, be uh, considered uh, um, a general uh, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, omnicomprehensive solution for psychiatry as a whole. I think that uh, uh, if uh, we 
are reminded of uh, what the uh, uh, limits uh, are and also the promises are of the different approaches in specific situations. For example, in a specific uh, uh, research uh, uh, program, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's something that can uh, uh, advance, uh, uh, that can advance uh, psychiatry uh, united with uh, this uh, uh, methodological pluralism, which is one of the strong messages that, that the Aspers gave. I think there's another realm of um, mental discourse that we haven't yet really addressed and it could be important. For example, uh, it's possible to hypnotize people and even though they're obviously in pain because you subject them to painful stimuli and you see that the physiological uh, markers of pain are there, they will say, I'm not in pain, uh, because you've hypnotized them. Now, just as the child that you described, usually the boys, um, will say they feel nothing when the brain scan shows that obviously they're feeling quite a bit. And now, the question arises what you do about this, and of course I have not the faintest notion what you do about it, but I think it does open up a whole realm of discourse here. Uh, if the person is obviously experiencing or emotion on, on the physiological level but denying it on the psychological level, uh, it, it leads to the suspicion that there's some narrative going on which is something like a hypnotic uh, uh, suggestion which is influencing their life in a very profound way. And I think, I know that this has gone out of fashion with the, you know, you know with psychoanalysis is not, no longer really that much in fashion among scientifically minded uh, psychologists. But there is, I think Jaspers w w would have said that the human narrative the stories we tell ourselves, our beliefs, uh, our convictions, are something that are very important, and that we that the the clinician needs to uh, you know take note of that because it, there could be uh, something of uh, great significance to to mental illness. I wasn't no, I, I doesn't I wasn't disputing that because you have to address what the what the patient is saying, and yet in terms of treatment though. If the two are in conflict, then what like what do you decide to treat? And so if like over groups of subjects, like you have, you know, groups and groups we study like th thousands of kids and if you can if you can identify mechanisms that are similar across these groups, then maybe it gives you insights as to the treatment. So on the individual case, like of course you have to talk to the patient. Like I, I don't think I was disputing that. But if over hundreds or thousands of kids, like you identify very similar neural mechanisms that you can then act on, then maybe that can inform treatment in a way that might otherwise not be possible. I don't know, I think it's a different starting point. Like they both need each other and where, where you choose to define the emotion is, might be different. Kalina, can you tell me if Jaspers really uh, might be helpful for uh, a scientist as you? In, w in what sense? Because so far what I hear is uh, it's like we are not merging, we are diverging in approach to the mental or psychological phenomena. You say human brains, and we say human as behavior, emotions, self-narrative, lying, deception, illusions, culture, religion. You know, like on our side, on our side, there are much more, you know, many more layers of uh, human phenomena than on your side. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe it's good to, um, to exaggerate to make a point. I'm not saying that all these things are not important. I'm just saying that like the kinds of things that I study are in the brain and, and the, I choose to define emotions as change in brain state. I'm not saying that there are not other ways and I'm not saying these other ways are not important, but I'm saying like my definition of emotion is change in brain state. But I don't think, like, I think you're exaggerating, <laughs> you're exaggerating my position. Yeah, 
I mean, just as empathy, you know, like, do I believe that empathy is change in brain state um, in response to a painful stimulus? In order to quantify it and objectify it, yes. And there are individual differences in the response and those differences are meaningful because like you can, you can see these differences. Do I, when I experience it on a daily basis, do I think that way? No, I mean. <laughs> so when you see aggressive behavior, they're actually two different sorts of individuals who have the same behavior, but the behavior doesn't come from the same place. And so the, you can't observe it because the, they're still being aggressive. So intentionally hurting somebody else. If that's the definition of aggression, that's what they're doing. The kids are, the adults are. So the behavior as observed is the same, but the way in which that behavior occurs it comes from a different place. So I was describing these two sets of kids, like the one set of kid who misinterprets emotions when there's an ambiguous emotion, they see threat where there is none and they just react and they're, you know, impulsively react. And there's the second kind of kid who doesn't misinterpret anything and just aggresses on their own without reacting to anything. So the, the behavior is the same, but the response is not the same. So obviously this is, you know, it's not as clean as that and there's there's overlap between the two but but I think that in this case neuroscience can help distinguish between these two sets of kids in ways that behavior can't I, I don't think there's like one area that's like the aggression center or something like that so I, I definitely hope that I didn't give that impression um, it's more of a network and they're all sort of working together um, and as far as medication, I don't think that there's really like a medication to you know, affect like one brain region or network of regions. So, but in these two sets of kids, the way in which you can treat them is very different. So the kid that's misinterpreting emotional expressions, you can teach them to regulate, you can teach them. In fact, like those kids, they have much better outcomes than the second set of kids. Um, you know, they go on to, like if you look at psychopaths, if you look at history of psychopathic behavior, almost all of psychopaths had a history of conduct disorder with callous unemotional traits. And those are much harder to treat. But, but I mean, this, 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 this is a follow-up to, to, to Lydia's question about aggression and acting, acting on emotion and not acting on, on, uh, on emotion. And uh, I was at the stage with a conversation I had on New Year's Eve with a, a criminal court judge. Who was, who was guest in our house, and he um, uh, recused himself from the Eric Garner case on, uh, on Staten Island. And I was having a, a discussion, he says, you know, it's very hard to know uh, from the perspective of the policeman the fear, you know, of this large man resist, resisting arrest and what might, what might happen, that there would be real fear that would be there, and how can we know what that fear is? And I had to demure and say, well, you know, I live in Brooklyn. You think I don't know what it means to see the other side of a gun and a knife? <laughs> you know, however, my response in those situations has always been to try to slow down the situation, to let it play, play out, and to de-escalate it. Whereas the officers, in this case, you know, response was to, to escalate and to speed up the situation. Now, I don't want to make a, a value judgment on this, but the question is, is that fear? And do you suspect that the uh, biological manifestation of that fear would have been different in the two, two cases, the different parts of our brains lighting up, even though we're both reporting the same emotion, fear? Yes. Yeah, so you, you think that, 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 yeah. that in fact, Using that term, the police officer and myself, is actually not reporting the same thing. So the really interesting thing, I showed you the amygdala, right? And the amygdala, that, that's a really, that comes from animal literature. It comes from research with mice. So when an organism responds to threat, you see activation specifically in that region. So any response to threat will see an activation in that region. Really interestingly, that's the same region that's activated in, in aggression too. The same region that's responsive to, to threat and to fear is also, you see modulations in the amygdala 
when you're aggressive and you can see changes in response you can do like testosterone challenges you can look at modulation and it's the same it's the same region so i think there's a lot to be said for that and yet the response could be well so in yeah well so in it could be very different but in that second set of kids that i told you about that are not responding you see it they're just not active in that region. They just don't respond in that region. That's an exaggeration, to be fair, but you see, you see the opposite kind of pattern. Yeah. Again, let's all please join and thank our speakers, Dr. Kalina Mikowska, Dr. Niels Friedrich Wagner, and Dr. Luca Lavignino. Our uh, third and final speaker for this first session of the Carl Jasper Society of North America is Professor Ashraf Adil from Kutztown University of Pennsylvania. And the title of his paper is The Concept of Understanding in Jaspers and Contemporary Epistemology. Thanks, you, Nick. Uh, so really no psychiatry or psychopathology. I do not really have <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm gonna be basically talking about some features of uh, epistemic features of Jasper's uh, view of empathetic understanding and then uh, comparing them uh, to uh, some of the things that contemporary epistemologists, uh, analytic epistemologists, uh, uh, say about uh, understanding, and uh, then back a few uh, uh, remarks at the end. Uh, as we know, Jasper fa is famous distinction between explainable and understandable uh, uh, in the general psychopathology is both epistemic and ontological. He draws the distinction in the following way. Uh, we sink ourselves into the psychic situation and understand genetically by empathy how one psychic event emerges from another. This is number one. Number two, we find by repeated experience that a number of phenomena are regularly linked together and on this basis, we explain causally. So here is a distinction between causal explanation on the one end and empathetic understanding on the other. From the epistemic perspective, we sink into another person's psychic situation and through this empathetic experience, grasp what Jasper calls meaningful psychic connections. This type of experience is obviously different from our experience of regular linkage between phenomena that helps us see the causal connections. Ontologically, the object of our empathetic experience of another's psychic situation are the elements of meaningful connections as opposed to elements of causal connections that are grasped through experience of regular linkages. The idea here seems to be that explanation is focused on uncovering causal connections that are mostly taken as mechanistic in the post-Newtonian era. This same mechanistic model does not apply in Jasper's opinion to the mental life. This is obviously because there are no mechanistic regularities that can be experienced or discovered as governing our mental life, particularly the mental life of a psychic patient. Jasper distinguishes empathetic understanding not only from causal explanation but also from rational understanding. In his own words, and I quote, rational understanding always leads to a statement that the psychic content was simply a rational connection, understandable without the help of any psychology. Empathetic understanding, on the other hand, always leads directly into the psychic connection itself. So the point of this distinction seems to be that psychic connections are not all of them only rational in their nature. And this is contra-Davidsonian 
philosophy of mind. Davidson says that, you know, when you are trying to interpret another person's desires and beliefs, you need to take him or her to be rational according to your lights. So you interpret his behavior, his desires and beliefs as much in rational terms as possible from your point of view. This is his principle of charity. It's very important for, for him as far as interpretation of the other's mind is concerned. But, we, you know, Jasper's position difference is, seems to be different. Jasper thinks that rational understanding is not going to help us understand a psychic patient and connection between two, because it's not, in fact, presumably, the connections between psychic events of a patient uh, are not rationally comprehensible. Uh, so some of these connections elude rational understanding and can be understood only empathetically by, quote, sinking into the psyche of the other. The mental life or consciousness, therefore, is not all of it understandable through discovering rational connections between psychic events. In particular, mental patients ex exhibit or experience psychic events that can be understood not in ordinary rational terms, but only in only imagined by imaginatively sinking into the patient's psyche. Does that mean that our empathetic understanding is extra-rational or irrational? I think not. Presumably, it is creative or inventive reason, as Popper would call it, that some that, that comes into play to uh, to see these special meaningful connections between psychic events. Uh, Popper thinks that rationality has two components to it: invention of ideas and hypotheses and myths and then their critique. And that's how, you know, we have progressed through the ages. Now, this inventive dimension is where, you know, where I think it basically I feel that empathetic understanding ultimately is creative and inventive in this artistic sense. Jasper also takes sympathetic understanding to be effective. That is, when successful, it is effective and he distinguishes it from what he calls interpretation of a psychic connection. Successful or true empathetic understanding yields an insight that is also self-evident. It, it helps us see the other's experience as, as it really is. A mere interpretation is when empathetic understanding fails to expose such experience to us correctly. In a 1912 article, Jasper draws a distinction between what he calls objective and subjective symptoms of mental disorder and argues as follows. Objective symptoms can all be directly and conv convincingly demonstrated to anyone capable of sense perception and logical thought. But subjective symptoms, if they are to be understood, must be referred to some process which in contrast to sense perception and logical thought is usually described by, by the same term, subjective. Subjective symptoms cannot be perceived by the sense organs, but have to be grasped by transferring oneself, so to say, into the other individual's psyche, that is, by empathy. They can only become an inner reality for the observer by his participating in the other person's experiences, not by any intellectual effort. Now, given these, you know, specifications about empathetic understanding, we need to ask ourselves as to what sense can one make of uh, Jasper's distinction between understandable and explainable. At the first blush, the idea, as I've suggested, seems to be that the distinction is between causal understanding of events and uh, that is what we call explanation and some kind of an immediate grasp of relationships between mental events that is acquired through immersion into the other's psyche. But the question is, how does one understand the meaningful connection between two psychic events empathetically? Event A leads to event B in the psyche of a mental patient. I imagine myself to be in the same situation as the patient and empathize to see the connection between A and B. 
in Jasper's own characterization, it comes to me as self-evident when I understand it successfully. Jasper considers this to be a personal insight. This is word personal is a quote from him. A personal insight that is not based on any observed regularity uh, between a crest of A leading to B. It is a fresh intuition every time. Also, it can be either genuine understanding or a mere interpretation depending on whether or not it successfully makes the patient's experience visible to me. Visible again is a quote from General Psychopathology. Now there are two issues that need to be addressed here. First, we need to figure out the way in which event B emerges out of event A. Second, we need to figure out as to what is the public criterion for the veracity of my personal intuition of the meaningful connection between A and B. Now I shall return to the second issue below, but as far as the first is concerned, if the connection between the two events is meaningful rather than causal, then how do we construe the nature of this relationship? Jasper's word emerge seems to suggest some kind of a causal linkage between the two psychic events. But if meaningful connection is construed as ultimately causal in nature, then the need for drawing a distinction between understandable and explainable evaporates. Meaningful relationship between the two psychic events becomes causal relationship and hence remains no longer different from the explainable relation. Therefore, we need to resist the temptation to interpret Jasper's word emerges causally. Now I'm going to skip uh, some parts here as there are some quotes and uh, these, uh, you know, uh, quotes refer to uh, our creative or, art, uh, creative or artistic nature of how one understands meaningful connections between psychic phenomena. There are no set rules for working out such intuitive and creative comparisons that Jasper talks about in his 1912 article. It appears, therefore, that empathetic understanding gives us linkages between psychic events that are creative like insights of artists. It is perhaps for this reason that Jasper notes about empathetic understanding that we can never give it recognition as science. Now, the second part, I, I say a few things about you know contemporary epistemology. A number of leading contemporary epistemologists have started paying attention to the epistemic state of understanding instead of just continuing to focus on knowledge. Kavanwig, Zagzebski, Pritchard, Grimm, and many others have recently explored understanding as an epistemic state. Generally, there are three types of understanding that some of these epistemologists talk about. That is propositional understanding, objectual understanding, and atomistic understanding. Propositional understanding is where, ob where object of understanding is a proposition or referent of that clause. For example, Neil understands that X, or Neil understands that the school closes at 4 p.m. This is an example, this grasp of proposition or that clause, an example of propositional understanding. Objectual understanding is holistic in nature. When we say John understands bioethics, we are talking about objectual understanding. Lastly, atomistic understanding is concerned with understanding why of a situation or what of a situation or where of a situation or when of a situation. For example, Ruth knows why the school, Ruth understands why the school was closed. Now, as far as propositional understanding is concerned, epistemologists have noted that it cannot be generally distinguished from propositional knowledge. 
And basically, we have two types of, and I, I skipped the discussion on that, but basically, we have two types of understanding that are considered as paradigmatic by recent epistemologists. That is atomistic and objectual or holistic. Pritchard takes a atomistic understanding to be the basic paradigm, while Kwanwig and Zagzebski take the holistic understanding to be so. Let us look at some of these views. I think I'll just read Zagzebski's views, uh, read the passage on Zagzebski's view. Understanding might be a form of knowledge, says Zagzebski, but, and this is about propositional understanding, but she wants to point to a kind of understanding that is non-propositional, i.e., uh, uh, e.g., understanding gained from, from a map or a graph, etc. Such an understanding is not the same thing as understanding a set of propositions. She then adds two points that come out, out of a Plato's epistemology and that distinguish understanding from propositional knowledge. One, understanding is connected with mastery of an art or a technique. And two, understanding involves grasping of relations between parts or between parts and a whole. These relations could be spatial, temporal, or causal, what, what Grimm calls dependency relations. To these points from Plato, she adds a third of her own that similarly distinguishes understanding from propositional knowledge. She argues that while we can, under the right conditions, have propositional knowledge by testimony, we cannot have understanding by testimony. Understanding cannot be conveyed to another person. It is not a matter of conveying the right belief to another person as we do in case of testimonial knowledge. So as far as Kavanaugh and Pritchard's views are concerned, I skip them and now I'll go to the comparison. You get an idea, a rough idea of how they are approaching. So I go to the, the comparison uh, with, uh, with Jaspers. Jaspers is concerned with empathetic understanding. He does consider it to be effective as noted above and also contends that it comes to us as self-evident. I think that this self-evidence of empathetic understanding of meaningful connections between psychic events is the same thing as transparency of understanding talked about by epistemologists. I have skipped that section, but the epistemologists say that understanding basically is transparent in this sense that you cannot distinguish between appearance of understanding and real understanding. When you understand, you understand. That's it. There is no distinction between appearance and reality as far as understanding goes. Now, so I, I, I feel that, you know, the, the, uh, when, when Jasper says that under, empathetic understanding is meaningful, uh, he, he means something similar to what epistemologists talk about. The reason is that appearance of self-evidence also cannot be distinguished from real self-evidence. If a truth is self-evident to you, then its appearance of being self-evident is enough. So you can't again distinguish between appearance and reality in case of what you understand to be self-evident. Now, a self-evident truth is justified by, by our very understanding of it and is non-inferential or immediate. And this is what Jasper also uh, says about empathetic understanding. With this kind of truths, understanding is the same thing as justifiably believing. There is no distinction between appearance of truth and real truth. This makes Jasper's position on empathetic understanding to be quite unique. None of the three epistemologists discussed above take either objectual that is holistic or atomistic understanding to be both factive, that is exposing reality or fact or truth to us, and transparent. 
for Zagzebski, objectual or holistic understanding is transparent but not effective. You can, you, some of your beliefs could be when you understand bioethics, you understand the connections, but some of your beliefs could be false. Effective means that it gives you the truth. And uh, she, she, she thinks it is understanding is transparent but not effective. For Kavanvig, holistic understanding is neither effective nor transparent. And Pritchard takes atomistic understanding to be effective but not transparent. So Jasper is unique in holding empathetic understanding to be both effective and transparent. Now, can such understanding be both? Pritchard thinks that that is not possible. And here is a quote. Since if understanding is effective, then it clearly cannot be transparent as the effectivity of understanding would require there to be a distinction between thinking that certain facts obtain and their obtaining, contrary to what the transparency thesis demands. Effectivity requires the distinction between reality and appearance. Transparency abolishes that distinction. So you cannot have the understanding, empathetic understanding, to be both effective and transparent or self-evident simultaneously. We also know that Jasper draws a distinction between genuine understanding and pseudo-understanding, that is, a mere interpretation of it. Therefore, he must be insisting on effectivity of successful empathetic understanding and not that of pseudo-understanding or mere interpretation. But then, how can he simultaneously take successful understanding to be self-evident? In case of understanding, some, un understanding something as self-evident, we cannot apparently draw a distinction between genuine understanding and an appearance of it. Therefore, there seems to be, you know, these, the use, Jasper's use of these epistemic epithets like effective and self-evidence, according to contemporary epistemology, there seems to be some tension between, between them. Thanks for all of you for coming out tonight. So I'd like to welcome you to the second session of the Carl Jasper Society of North America. Um, so my name is uh, Niels Friedrich Wagner. I'm from the University of Ottawa. And I'm jumping in for um, Professor Alan Olson, who couldn't be here tonight due to an illness, but he sends his greetings to all of you. Um, so we'll have four speakers tonight for this session, and we'll start with um, Andrew. Gluck. Then we'll have um, Alina Feld, Lydia Voruntia, and Elena Butsubova. I'm sorry for pronouncing your names uh, poorly. Um, and I also would like to welcome our commentator, which is uh, Dr. Thomas Rockmore from the Peking University. Um, so we'll proceed with the session as follows. So um, start with um, Dr. Andrew Gluck and his paper. I think a lot of the epistemological problems that people find or have with Jaspers really stem from an a priori bias, either ontological or metaphysical, that is relatively unexamined. And I'll go even further and I'll say that even those of us who are aware of this bias uh, and don't like it uh, are affected by it as well. So uh, let's hope that Jaspers can liberate us from a constricted um, ontology. I'm going to be speaking about two subjects, happiness and consciousness. Uh, now, we have a foremost expert on melancholia here, but so far we haven't dealt too much with happiness, and neither does Jaspers, actually. Um, 
But let me speak a little bit about Daniel Kahneman and his concept of the experiencing self and happiness. Now, happiness is a very hot topic. Uh, I don't know how many of you know, there's now a journal of happiness studies put out by Springer Verlag. Who would have thought, right? Um, and Kahneman is a great social scientist. He's not a philosopher. Uh, and he and his late colleague, uh, Amos Tversky, practically invented the field of behavioral economics. But lately, he's turned his attention to happiness. And um, he's part of this burgeoning field. So what does he say about it? He gives a uh, description of a vacation that he took that went wonderfully until the very end, and then something occurred at the airport, uh, some disaster, and whenever he looks back at this vacation, he can only see it as a disaster. <laughs> Even though he enjoyed it the vast majority of the time. So he says we have two selves. We have the experiencing self. That's the one that you know, kicks in when you ask somebody, how are you feeling now? Uh, and then there's the narrating self, or the uh, remembering self, the one that tells us stories and plans for the future. Maybe a better example that he gives, you go to a concert, wonderful symphony, you enjoy every minute of it until the very end, and then you hear this horrible screeching sound, the whole thing is ruined. Now why is this? It seems totally illogical that we can't benefit from or enjoy those moments of happiness that we had. Well, his explanation is an evolutionary one. He says, the creatures that survived were not the ones who enjoyed themselves smelling the flowers. The ones who survived are the ones who, were, who made it to the end. So, to, in order to reproduce. So we're concerned with good endings. If it doesn't end well, it might not as well happen. So, now of course, Kahneman and his associates don't just rely on evolutionary theory. They also, um, you know, create experiments. They're psychologists. Here's a very good experiment. Um, you put somebody's hand in cold water, 14 degrees centigrade, it's pretty cold, for 60 seconds. Then you run another trial. You put the same people's hand in 14 degrees centigrade water for 60 seconds, then gradually raise it up to 15 degrees for another 30 seconds. Which trial do you think people are going to prefer? Anybody have an idea? Prefer or remember? Prefer at the end. If you say, <laughs> what would you prefer? That you, you go for the 60 second treatment or the 90 second treatment? 90 second treatment. The Amazingly, treatment. yeah, that's logical because it's all pain, right? But right. no, they prefer the longer one because they like that feeling of relief. relief. Okay. <laughs> So these are some of the paradoxes of happiness and human experience. Um, there are many others, many others uh, you could, we could talk about, uh, but I don't want to bore you with it and I don't have the time anyway. Now, I don't think that Kahneman's notion of experience is adequate, but I do agree with him that the experiential self is the victim of the storytelling self. Uh, it's being bullied all the time by our storytelling self. But this is the real question for a philosopher. Is this how it ought to be? And Kahneman just assumes, I think, 
that it should not be that way. Although, I have to give him credit that recently, under a lot of pressure from other people in happiness studies, uh, <laughs> what, a, what a name, happiness studies. So, he has admitted that he was wrong and that he now realizes that life narratives are very important and that they contribute to human happiness. So human happiness is not just m enjoying the moment, moment to moment, you know. The narrative itself that we drill into ourselves could contribute to human happiness. So this is where I'm going to segue into consciousness because I think it's fairly evident to me that happiness, at least the kind of happiness that Kahneman is speaking about, is a form of consciousness. Um, Kahneman, of course, is associated with what you, we call the hedonic school of happiness. And then there's another school uh, called the eudaimonic. I think a lot of these people misuse these terms, but they're not philosophers. Very often they're psychologists. Um, and they, they use these terms in a, you know, perhaps too radical a way, but um, there's something to it. I'm now going to speak about um, a very important individual in the field of consciousness studies that I'm sure you're all aware of, David Chalmers, and the hard problem of consciousness. So this is, the, this is the question. Why is there consciousness at all? Why do we experience anything? That's a hard, that's a hard question. Now, he, let me just give you the easy questions first, but I'm, we're not going to spend much time on them, just so you get an idea. The easy questions are the ability to discriminate, categorize, and react to environmental stimuli, the integration of information by a cognitive system, the reportability of mental states, the ability of a system to access its own internal states, the focus of attention, the deliberate control of behavior, and the difference between wakefulness and sleep. But there are many easy problems. There's only one hard problem. The really hard problem of consciousness, he says, is the problem of experience. When we think and perceive, there is a whir of information processing, but there is also a subjective aspect. As Nagel has put it, there is something it is like to be a conscious organism. This subjective aspect is experience. When we see, for example, we experience visual sensations, the felt quality of redness, the experience of dark and light, quality of depth in a visual field, other experiences go along with perception in different modalities, the sound of a clarinet, the smell of mothballs. Then there are bodily sensations from pains to orgasms, mental images that are conjured up internally, the felt quality of emotion, and the experience of a stream of conscious thought. And I think that last one is very important because it's been overlooked by a lot of investigators in consciousness. The consciousness that's associated with thought. Um, what, what unites all of these states is that there is something it is like to be in them. All of them are states of experience. Now, when he asks this question, why is there consciousness at all? A lot of people laugh and say, well, of course, consciousness confers some evolutionary adaptive advantage. That's why there's consciousness. Originally, there was no consciousness, but some creature by mutation was conscious, and it was able to somehow be a little more flexible, or this or that, or figure things out, you know. Okay, so I shouldn't speak for Chalmers, I'll speak for myself, um, but I, he would probably agree with me, even if that's true, and it's a very contentious issue whether consciousness actually confers competitive adaptive advantage. But even if it were true, why wouldn't unconscious creatures have grown up that mimic the conscious ones? They wouldn't be burdened with all this internal uh, experience. They would just be able to react in a smart way 
and they would pretend to be conscious. Now, Chalmers calls them zombies. Now, the thing that you have to know about zombies is very important that if there is a zombie, you wouldn't know there is a zombie. They would act as if they were conscious. Why is that? Because obviously in human society, zombies are not going to be very successful. You have to be able to empathize with other people, pretend to hear them and understand them and all this and care about them. So the zombies would be um, like... Um, like that individual that Thrasymachus describes in uh, you know, the Republic, would pretend to be ethical but really wouldn't be. So that, that was what a zombie uh, is. Now, this is his solution. We know what the problem is. What's the solution? Since the zombies would have beaten us out, isn't that what Stephen Hawkins also said recently, that the intelligent machines are likely to beat us out? Mm -hmm. Because they're more efficient, simpler design, right? So if that's the case, why are there no zombies? Why are we conscious? And his solution is, well, look, consciousness just is. It just is. It's as, part, as much a part of reality as space and time. We don't ask. Why is there matter? We don't ask why is there space? Why is there time? So we shouldn't really ask why is there consciousness? That's, the, that's his solution. So before I move into um, Jaspers, I would just like to say this about um, Chalmers. He calls himself a dualist. And he understands why people don't like dualism. And this is one of the reasons. A fourth motivation to avoid dualism has arisen from various spiritualistic, religious, supernatural, and other anti-scientific overtones of the view. Uh, and he says a naturalistic dualism, which is the, the kind that Chalmers likes, expands our view of the world, but it does not invoke the forces of darkness. So, on that note, I'll move into the forces of darkness, but I'd just like to say, before I do that, that it seems to me that Chalmers has also assumed too much. Why is it so essential that consciousness be deeply embedded in the natural world. Why can't it be an invasion from another realm? And maybe, if it is, maybe that's why UFOs and abduction stories are so popular. Not that I believe them, but uh, there may be, they may be locking into some reality. So I'm going to now move to uh, Jaspers. In the paper, I look at a lot of other things, but um, don't have time for that. Um, in the sixth part of the general psychopathology, Jaspers introduces it by saying that we're now moving from science to something else, mainly to f philosophy. Um, to the empirical statements of the first five parts, we now add a sixth and final part. It does not increase our knowledge, but in it we reflect upon some fundamental philosophical questions. Such reflection seems important enough not to be omitted. It is no longer part of the field of psychopathological science as such, but it has a general relevance. At times, he calls um, this understanding that he wants to convey to us faith, and sometimes he calls it pre-knowledge. Here's an example. We recognize in ourselves something which we do not know and never otherwise experience in the world, save in communications with others. 
what do you suppose he's talking about? Freedom. It is not there for knowledge. Science cannot ever know about freedom. But it can make itself felt indirectly as we study the individual with his unaccountability, irregularity, and various disturbances. And as we try in our study to get an adequate and objective grasp of the person himself. But the freedom which the self experiences calls for illumination by philosophy. Um, then uh, he speaks about man sensing his own finiteness everywhere and can never be satisfied with it. He seeks after being itself, after the infinite and the other. Only this can give him satisfaction. Now the, I think the metaphysical basis, maybe that's not the right word, but um, for, for his view comes from Kant. Um, and this is what he says, but he, he twists Kant in a slightly different direction. Kant grasped that the world is not object, but idea. And that, w and that which we know is always in the world, but never the world. This world and transcendence encompasses us in a reality that is independent of us. Now, I think this concept of an encompassing is what really um, holds him apart from the other two thinkers that I spoke about, and I think We'll, we'll understand a little better very shortly. But when our own being is that which encompasses, this bears a different meaning. So there is transcendence, but there's also the human being as an encompassing. And he speaks about it in three different modes. First of all, where human existence does sign. That is, where life in a world is with everything else. That which encompasses all living things becomes objectified in the products of that life. Yet, whether these are bodily form, physiological function of the universal hereditary connections of life, or on the other hand, specifically human tools, deeds and constructs. Life itself is never exhausted in these products, but remains that which encompasses. Whence everything emerges, when the individual human existence admits this as such within the following modes, fosters these and bends them to its service, it reaches its fullest manifestation. Um, that's the first thing, life itself, um, a kind of vital uh, uh, being. Then we are consciousness in general. That is, we partake in the generally valid which, which through the division of being into subject and object allows all objectivity to be known formally to the subject. Only what enters into this general consciousness becomes being for us. We ourselves are that which encompasses, within which everything that is can be thought, known, recognized, touched upon, or listened to in objective form. And finally, number three, we are mind. That is, we are always being led by ideas to a complex unity of meaningful connections within ourselves and within all that we have produced, achieved, and thought. Now, I think the, of those three modes, the only one that the previous thinkers might be able to relate to at all is the first. And even there, we find that um, Chalmers has a distinct dislike for biology, uh, far prefers physics, so uh, he might not even like that first mode. But it seems to me that among many modern epistemologists and scientists, 
that even when they are willing to allow non-material properties into their metaphysics, as with Chalmers, who is probably the best example, there's still a tendency to think that the human being is only authentic when he or she seriously is acknowledging and coordinating it himself or herself with the physical world that encompasses it, us. And this is where uh, well-being fits in, even though Jaspers does not explicitly discuss it. Now, getting back to personal narratives. Well, it's undoubtedly true that personal narratives often do interfere with the enjoyment and appreciation of one's life. It's good to be careful here before we condemn them as irrational. They also have the potential to enormously enhance the appreciation of life. In fact, what would life be without a personal narrative? So take somebody with Alzheimer's disease. They might actually be able to experience moment to moment, but their memory has been lost to the point where they've lost their self. So to get to the conclusion here, which is, <clears throat> I would suggest that for at least some individuals, the formula for happiness and fulfillment is exactly the converse of Tolstoy's opinion regarding families. And what I'm speaking about here is the attempt to found a science of happiness. Because the science for Jaspers indicates that it's a kind of a universal thing. That, uh, you know, I don't have my science and you have your science. We all study the same science. Uh, no matter what our values, no matter what our ideology, science doesn't really vary that much. But happiness does. Keeping in mind certain constraints, some of us may ultimately find happiness or fulfillment in our own very peculiar ways. Jaspers was one of the few thinkers to truly appreciate the individual and his or her uniqueness, while still never losing sight of the universal knowledge that we call science, as well as the transcendent nature of consciousness. As his study of Leonardo attests, it is a concrete individual as an entire unique and perceived being that is really the most important thing. In fact, that is his characterization of the philosophy of Leonardo. Yet, in obvious contrast to that appreciation, he also criticizes Leonardo for failing to appreciate transcendence and the ultimate source of his unique genius. Jaspers actually does not discuss happiness in the general psychopathology nearly as much as he does consciousness. And it may well have been a subject that did not really interest him that much. We found him alluding to the consolation of faith, however, and his student Arendt discussed the happiness to be found in the least creative and least intelligent labors of humankind. This is a suggestive of, of an attitude that might be explored further. In co contrast, Jasper's great interest in consciousness could not be clearer. I suspect that a correct understanding of consciousness, while not necessarily productive of happiness, might help us understand it a little better and might even obviate the obsessive desire for it. 
I should also add here a short mention of recent well-documented experiments with consciousness enhancing drugs that have had good results in lifting depression. Admittedly, such treatments are dangerous. While I will not attempt to document the empirical evidence, this fits in very well with my suspicion that unhappiness is often tied to a constricted view of human consciousness and therefore a blunting of the great adventure that we call human life. It is in that regard that Jaspers perhaps has something to say indirectly about happiness. And I will end there. I just wanted to say I think it's very interesting that um, you allude to the shift in the general psychopathology from uh, the first five parts into part six uh, and the human being as a whole. And there we see the origin of Jasper's philosophy of the encompassing. And um, the, um, the point I'm wondering in relationship to well-being, and I've thought about this a lot in terms of the general psychopathology, and that is that you have the modes of being that we are in our subjectivity, das umgreifende, das uh, 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 subjective uh, uh, being, but that also in the modes of subjectivity, Dasein, Bewusstsein, Überhaupt, and Geist, the three modes that you mentioned, you also have the, uh, the idea of the unity of the modes. That is, the unity of the modes of subjective being that usher into Megliche existence. That is, the poss possible existence of the integration of the body um, of the intellect and of the spirit, much like Plato's harmony of the soul. And you have rationality or reason, which he refers to metaphorically as the glue that holds uh, that all together in the subjectivity of self-identity. And I'm wondering, uh, Andy, whether you would see that early formulation as something like a theory of personality where uh, happiness and your reference to where well-being fits in has to do with the harmony of the relationship between the modes of being that we are in subjectivity as well as the modes of being that exist in relationship to object sign or to what Jaspers calls Welt and Transcendence. Well, that's actually a great question. I, I wish I could answer it, but I, I, <laughs> I do recall, I, I think I recall, um, or maybe I should say I recall, but I could be wrong, uh, <laughs> that Jaspers talked about an ancient philosopher who said that happiness is the reconciling of opposites. I forget who that philosopher was, but, okay. No, no, it was an ancient philosopher. Kusanis might have said it too. Yeah, okay. But um, I'm pretty sure this is an ancient philosopher that, that uh, uh, Kusa got it from. But uh, that would fit in with what you said. And I just remember he mentioned, he, uh, he mentioned this at some point in one of his writings. Uh, they, again, I. I, I think Jaspers had a great respect for the individual and understood that every synthesis is going to be different and that uh, there's, no, there's no one way. Um, I have a question about the fulfillment and happiness. I don't think that fulfillment does not necessarily uh, be something which we call happiness. Uh, experience can be traumatic and the stories, as you say, narratives could be the way to to conduct a therapy and therapeutic experience sometimes instead 
canceling what was bad in experience, just the op do just the opposite. Uh, it confirms it because traumatic experience could be necessarily uh, productive for human existence. So uh, a person, my point is that a person cannot necessarily uh, come to conclusion, to the end, uh, something what you call happiness. Uh, to be unhappy, it doesn't mean, uh, doesn't mean to be not fulfilled. Just the opposite, to feel the, the reality of life, especially in the religious experience. Take the Francis from um, Assisi. Uh, he wanted pain because he wanted to be happy. Uh, I also refer to, I would refer to the, uh, a lot of experienced artists and musicians uh, would feel, poets. Uh, the, so the pain is the source of pleasure and they're not uh, like perverted mentality or something. They are, they are creative personalities. So this is, it's, it's more complex than uh, you portrayed. So. <laughs> And, uh, no. and, uh, I, I have a whole section actually which I didn't have time to read on the uh, he, hedonic happiness versus eudaimonic happiness. And I think what you're talking about in terms of fulfillment would be more the what often people call eudaimonic, but um, there's a problem there. And I don't disagree with you, by the way. I actually agree with you. I think there's a big difference between meaning in life and fulfillment in life and even eudaimonia, as described by Plato and Aristotle. Um, that they didn't, I don't think they really had a concept of that, you know, the ancients. I think it's something that came into the world much, much later, you know. But, uh, it's true. We often seek pain. We, uh, we, we, f we feel that there's meaning in suffering. Uh, and, and this is something that the, the school of happiness, whether, whether it's a hedonic or uh, eudaimonic, often doesn't really um, recognize. So I certainly uh, don't disagree with you one bit. So good evening. Um, well, uh, I I was interested in uh, in uh, Jasper's uh, relevance today, um, and for today's uh, practical uh, or clinical uh, treatment, uh, clinical psychology, and um, for neuroscience in general. And I would like to open this uh, question uh, to the experts. Um, but uh, in order to do that, uh, I will go through, uh, I will consider um, Jasper's um, and briefly, um, Jasper's descriptive uh, phenomenology and briefly um, other two models of phenomenology, um, and that is uh, the psychiatrist, philosopher psychiatrist um, Ludwig uh, Binswanger and, um, and Michel Henry. Um, Ma many of, uh, of these uh, issues have been um, discussed, uh, touched upon uh, uh, last time, yesterday. So um, let's see. Carl Jasper's uh, general psychopathology was, uh, as we know, published uh, uh, in 1913, 100 years later. Um, and one year, uh, in the face of the radical transformation uh, of our world, no less in the domain of neuroscience, uh, we can ask, uh, has Jasper's psychopathology been overcome? Uh, what is the status of uh, his project within psychiatry today? And what is credited to Jasper's today uh, as um, um, the general uh, psychopathology main contributions? 
Um, among among uh, other things, or the main things, would be the founding of uh, psychopathology as a science, descriptive psychopathological uh, phenomenological uh, as basis of psychopathology, a dualist methodology of empathetic understanding of meaning and causal explanation of the non-understandable. Uh, existential therapy uh, based on empathetic understanding, uh, the rejection of the twofold uh, reductionism of psychic and somatic approaches, and a vigorous uh, methodological anti uh, dogmaticism. Um, it would be difficult to overlook the similarities, the surprising similarities um, of mood, uh, debates, and main trends uh, in psychiatric research between our time and uh, Jasper's time. Beginning with the 1850s, a period of rapid enthusiastic uh, advances in the natural sciences was followed by a period of skepticism and disappointment. And that was uh, when Jaspers uh, wrote. Jaspers' remarks on, on the mood of stagnation and pessimism in therapeutics at the Heidelberg Clinic and embarks on the task of revising psychiatry uh, by rediscovering its object, uh, the pathos of the psychic, understood as mind or soul. Similarly, uh, in the second half of the 20th century, we witnessed large strides in causal explanation fostered by technological progress in all domains, uh, psychiatry included, and as a result, a deep crisis of psychopathology, which was deemed irrelevant or reduced to a subordinate role um, in psychiatry as a list of symptoms. Our contemporary presuppositions continue to reveal a general adherence to the same biological reductionist dogma, first articulated by William uh, Griesinger. Uh, quote, psychic disorders are nothing but uh, cerebral disorders, and reiterated today by neuroscientists and reductive and eliminative uh, materialist philosophers. William Meyer declares psychic disorders to be brain disorders and eliminative materialist philosophers. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, declare psychic disorders to be brain disorders and mental states rep representable uh, with medical imaging as states or processes of the brain. A step further, Paul Churchland uh, urges us to abandon folk psychology altogether as unscientific obscurantism, uh, a completely misguided superstition, similar to erroneous causal um, uh, concepts of the past, such as the phlogiston and witches, <laughs> that evidently should not be uh, simply renamed, but must be uh, radically eliminated and replaced by real science. Uh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, uh, starting with the third edition, um, though anti-theoretical, is marked by unquestioned empirical reductionism. The Hempel-Oppenheim uh, uh, model of logic empiricism leading to the objectification of psychic phenomena. But now there was a paradigm shift. Uh, however, in the last decade, there has been a shift away from pioneer self-assurance uh, to more mature uh, or skeptical attitudes. Jasper's questions and positions are becoming timely again. Uh, Christoph uh, Mund explains um, that the extreme paucity and impotence of uh, the DSM categories, um, for example, the incapacity to validate separate clinical syndromes and radical objectivism that eliminated the view from inside based on empathy, provoked dissatisfaction with the present reductionism and reconsideration of theories promoting a more nuanced and comprehensive interpretation of mental pathologies. 
we are witnessing a reformulation of the debate about uh, the epistemological, therapeutic, and ethical value of extreme reductionism and an increasing uh, skepticism about it. In, so, um, in terms of psychopathology, Jasper's yes, psychopathology, this context uh, explains the renewal of interest in the role of uh, Jasper's psychopathology in today's uh, psychiatry. According to Stan Galini and Fox, um, after being uh, neglected and dismissed as unscientific or a stopgap uh, devoid of epistemic value, psychopathology is returning. Jasper's investigations, both in methodological uh, understanding and in non-understandable, and clinical matters defining delusion and self-awareness, give rise to new debates. There emerges an awareness that psychopathology may be a sine qua non discipline for psychiatry and clinical psychology. Thus, descriptive psychopathology provides a common language and ground for uh, psychiatry, a heterogeneous discipline whose adepts approach it from different angles, such as neuroscience, depth psychology, sociology, philosophy, each with its own language, uh, method, and practice. Descriptive psychopathology thus bridges the gap between understanding and caring, epistemological and ethical paradigms between human and clinical sciences and defines what is abnormal and what is human in the irrational and incomprehensible. On the other uh, hand, clinical psychopathology provides the data for diagnosis and classifications while structural psychopathology, based on the meanings of personal experience, contributes to the understanding of intelligibility and its limits. Jaspers founded psychopathology as a science uh, with its own object, methodology, and critical conscience of its methodology um, in uh, Werner Janzarik's um, um, statement. His aim was high, that of founding a, a new psychiatric discipline by bringing order out of chaos, quote, of psyche phenomena by rigorous descriptions, definitions, and classifications, and empower psych psychiatry with a valid and reliable method to assess and make sense of abnormal human subjectivity, unquote. The method of rigorous description, definition, and classification that Jaspers introduces in psychopathology is phenomenological. With Jaspers, in fact, phenomenology, psychopathology, the domain to be mapped, and descriptive phenomenology, the method appropriate for the task, emerge together. Jaspers ad adopts early Husserl's concept concepts of intuition, description, and presuppositionless uh, methodology and adapts them to psychopathology. Descriptive phenomenology will be consistently applied throughout the uh, general psychopathology in confrontation with uh, reductionism in its two forms of somatic and psychic approaches. Jaspers opposes the psychic model, which reduces mental disease to a moral or religious defect proper to the psyche, and was especially critical, uh, as we know, of a Freudian psychoanalysis, which interpreted conscious mental states as forms of self-deception. However, his main target here uh, was the somatic model, which he calls somatic prejudice or bias. Jasper's dualist methodology of understanding and explanation is grounded, it seems, in a Cartesian and in Cartesianism and Neo-Kantianism. Uh, here, a form of uh, apophatic anthropology, if I can use this term. 
from the beginning, he declares his theoretical and methodological positions. His existentialist respect for the mysterious and incomprehensible whole of the object of research, that is the psyche, as well as for the uniqueness of the individual case, neither of which can be the object of scientific approach in themselves, but only in their manifestations. Morbid psychic phenomena, uh, Jaspers believes, are ultimately rooted in the phenomenon of men, in the phenomenon men, uh, as unconfined freedom, which lies beyond the reach of empirical inquiry. Man is the great question, um, he believes, that stands at the margin of our knowledge. Accordingly, um, he believes that psychopathology must be grounded in empathetic understanding of the patient experience in an intimate view from the inside. For therapy to take place, a profound relationship must be established between patient and psychopathologist, one in which authentic communication occurs. Jasper's emphasis on understanding and meaning points to a strong Weberian influence. However, uh, there is a moment, especially in schizophrenic delusion, uh, when the non-understandable is reached. The abnormal uh, psychic states differ from the normal states by arising endogenously as a psychological irredu irreducible. Since faced with the ununderstandable, the incomprehensible, rational understanding logically fails. Empathetic understanding must take over in a communication that necessarily transcends reason. Jaspers warns that resorting to a causal, to causal biological explanation departs from the inner subjective experience. He seems to view biological explanation uh, as a deus ex machina, a prop uh, incapable to authentically uh, solve the cipher of delusional pathetic uh, psychic states. It represents a leap into a parallel world a different paradigm and language, one that is irrelevant to individual subjectivity. The somatic perspective treats man as a creature of nature, but man, he insists, is a creature of culture. Jasper's psychopathology underscores this human duality and brings together in a tense relationship natural science and human science. However, there is neither a one-to-one -one nor an integral correlation between psyche and brain. Jaspers is clear about his position regarding localization of the mental. As with Cartesian dualism, the temporal reality of the mental and the spa spatiality of the brain are heterogeneous orders and cannot correspond one-to-one -one as identity theory claims. According to Jaspers, the somatic assumption of correlation is not verifiable, but only a source of metaphorical interpretation. In relation to the methodologic, uh, methodological shift from empathetic understanding of individual ex existence to causal explanation, Jaspers discusses theory formation in uh, psychopathology, uh, Carl Wernicke and Freud. Uh, von, von uh, Gebsadel and Strauss. Under somatic prejudice, at the moment when the alien, uh, the non-understandable, is encountered, uh, Occam razor is applied and the drive for causal explanation takes over. Opaque sources beyond consciousness, such as physical events, phases, periods, brain malfunction, disturbance in basal events, vital inhibition, repressive unconscious, non-time demons. The biological replaces existence itself. While both existence and the biological are impenetrable and incomprehensible, uh, ultimately, only existence is, Jaspers reflects, uh, capable of an infinite illumination. He is critical of uh, the shift from meaningful understanding uh, illuminated by existence to explanation that leads to a therapeutic appropriate to somatic fact. 
Jaspers does not deny validity to the latter, but criticizes the confusion of the two that fosters a non-philosophical philosophizing, uh, he calls it, and a pseudo-knowledge, respectively. The psychic and the somatic versions of reductionism, both dogmatic and unscientific, both biased and false. From a scientific perspective, the theology of the eclipse of or loss of God, for example, is as empty a hypothesis as is a disturbance in vitality. Now, if uh, this refers to uh, one of uh, of the major uh, states that he is uh, uh, looking into um, melancholy or depression, uh, but also of, uh, of aspects of depression are present in uh, in other disturbances like uh, schizophrenia. Knowledge of life should uh, not attempt to simulate scientific knowledge. Uh, he explains that the totality of human life and its ultimate origin cannot be the object of any uh, scientific research. Um, I will skip over that. Morbid states cannot be uh, contained uh, in a scientific theory. Instead, a philosophical existential interpretation is required. Psychic life uh, is an infinite whole, a totality that resists systematization and cannot be reduced to a few principles and psychological laws, but rather allows only tentative hypotheses. This form of Cartesian dualism of understanding and explaining uh, indicates, uh, as I said, uh, this Kantian apophaticism. Man can be uh, comprehended uh, only as a biological entity, only as a phenomenon, uh, not as a noumenon. Scientific causality accounts for extra-conscious foundations of, uh, of psychic life, the domain of the unconscious and the organic. It cannot encompass, comprehend, conscious subjectivity. This is Jasper's response to psychic reductionism, a Freudian prioritizing the unconscious as well as to somatic explanation. Subjective consciousness alone is the domain of meaning and understanding. Meaning and understanding must be extended empathetically to the incomprehensible of individual inner experience towards a philosophy of existence. It is for this reason that Jaspers appeals to phenomenological description. The pure appreciation of facts, patients experience without prejudice, but with detachment and sympathy. This description involves a sui generis epoche. Uh, and precludes any attempt at definition, generalization of morbid conditions. This is the reason why the major psychosis, melancholy, uh, manic depression, schizophrenia, epilepsy, appear as particular constellations of symptoms rather than as fully defined and classified uh, morbid entities. Now, uh, if we think of uh, alternative phenomenologies used in um, philosophical uh, psychiatry, um, we cannot um, um, eliminate uh, the go over Binswanger uh, because of uh, his uh, uh, complementary view of um, the disturbance at hand. And uh, they both focus, uh, as Andrew uh, noticed, uh, on uh, melancholy, depression, uh, schizophrenia uh, as an extension, uh, more than or uh, uh, to the uh, absence of, of happiness. Uh, <laughs> so for, for Jaspers, phenomenology involves the description of experiences presented by the patient. He models his descriptive phenomenology uh, after Husserl, but did not follow the evolution of phenomenology towards the eidetic approach explored by uh, Binswanger, nor the phenomenology of, bodily, uh, of the bodily subject of Michel Henry. Binswanger developed a transcendental uh, phenomenology of intentional consciousness, thereby complementing Jasper's descriptive uh, naturalist study that limits itself to the content of lived experience. Uh, this was a quote from Binswanger. Um, 
and he um, uh, places uh, von Gebsadl and Minkowski uh, in the same category. For Binswanger, phenomenology does not mean the descriptive phenomenology of subjective manifestations of psychic life, but is rather to be understood in terms of pure transcendental Husserlian phenomenology. Binswanger insists that his method belongs to the science of transcendental phenomenology, which is neither a psychology of inner experience, uh, he writes, nor one of lived experience nor a phenomenology of lived time or space, end quote. While like Jaspers, he distances himself from reductive explanations based on biological derivation, he also departs from the psychopathological attitude in order to discover the a priori structure of temporal intentionality. He adopts a pure transcendental phenomenological position in opposition to any psychological, natural, or naive attitude. The originality of his approach consists in the observation of the specific transcendental modification in, uh, in his case, in melancholy and mania, uh, that is the dissolution of the constitutive connections inside the transcendental order a structural order. The question that he poses is what happened to Dasein's transcendental occurring. In his analysis, melancholic disorder emerges as the outcome of the malfunctioning of the three egos, empirical, transcendental, and pure, in relation to intentionality and time. The pure ego is the key to his analysis because it is the pure ego that is charged with the constitution of the ego totality. He made visible both the empirical eye through case observation and the transcendental eye in the turn towards the structural elements constitutive of consciousness. The element missing uh, is the pure ego, which constitutes the unity of the two, the unity of the mundane empirical eye and the transcendental eye as constituted uh, experience in is the unity of mundane empirical experience and transcendental experience. In uh, non-melancholic experience, the pure ego performs its constitutive and unifying function with ease. In melancholy, by contrast, the pure ego is distressed and constrained. Its constitutive function is hindered and questioned. Uh, melancholy uh, for him indicates an alternation in the in, an alteration in the constitution of the pure ego, its perplexity, as a result of failing to function uh, properly. This negative moment actualizes it itself as dystemia, uh, dystemia, dystemia, uh, melancholic depression, anxiety and torment, or manic withdrawal from the task of total control over self and world. Uh, however, uh, it is the belonging to me uh, that uh, is never um, annulled if it, does, if it is impaired. It is never annulled uh, in uh, melancholy as it is um, and mania as it is in the case of schizophrenia. Uh, this belonging to me constitutes, in fact, the critical aspect of the distress since the self in pain is mine. It is I myself. Now, uh, if, we, uh, if we turn, or if I turn to uh, Michel Henry's uh, pathetic body, concept notion of the pathetic body, um, we uh, uh, exit uh, both uh, Jasper's phenomenological description and um, the transcendental description uh, towards uh, an integrative um, understanding of, uh, of being. Uh, his phenomenology, Michel Henry's phenomenology of the subjective body, situates itself in between. Uh, he opposes precisely uh, the Cartesian dualism in which the body uh, is a transcendent object confronting consciousness as, as its other. The being of the body is not a being there, an objective determination whose finitude contingency and absurdity are revealed to men 
qua metaphysical being. Naturalism, idealism, empiricism are all distortions of human nature separating the spirit from a natural, impersonal body. They misunderstand the essence of the human body as a first-person subjective body. Henri, by contrast, insists that the self and the body can never be separated. He elaborates uh, an ontology of immanent, pathetic, subjective body as a more primordial uh, be beginning, uh, in parallel to uh, Heidegger's more primordial beginning, and as the original revelation of the absolute. Human reality is the I am my body rather than I have my body. Subjectivity always comes embodied, is the life of the subjective body. Um, he insists that subjectivity uh, has always already a primordial content. content. The concept uh, of the internal transcendental experience, which gives life its irreducible primordial ontological density, a density that subsists even when life collapses in despair. So um, where do we stand today if we look at this uh, different interpretation, different alternatives uh, from today's perspective? Uh, and, and this will be brief <laughs> uh, because uh, the, the, the question uh, is posed to, uh, to the experts. Uh, Binswanger's transcendental analysis does not constitute a serious objection to Jasper's project and uh, nor resonate with contemporary sensibilities. In fact, from Jasper's perspective, Binswanger's theory would be criti critiqued along with uh, Gebsattel and Freud as a psychic approach leading to non-philosophical philosophy. Henry's body's subjective phenomenology, uh, with his vigorous attack of dualism, puts in question Jasper's asymptotic domains of psyche and body. And its intuition is being confirmed uh, in neuro by neuroplasticity. Perhaps Jasper's transient uh, dichotomy is the most vulnerable element in his uh, psychopathology. Uh, as in the case of Cartesian uh, classical dualism, the relation between the two orders of being becomes uh, an insoluble mystery. Along this line, um, Thomas Fox uh, notes that Jasper's dualism isolates subjectivity and renders corporeality foreign to understanding. Uh, he explains that science itself has been proven to be subordinated to cultural paradigms. The brain is now known as a historically and socially constituted organ, translating biological processes and subjective uh, experience back and forth, uh, which neuroplasticity has made uh, evident, uh, and, and neuroplasticity uh, has made evident that mind and body are engaged in a circular interplay. So uh, Henri's uh, subjective body seems to be a more adequate philosophical hypothesis uh, in for uh, present day research and mood than Jasper's uh, dichotomic being. According to uh, Helen Mayberg, uh, we have been witnessing a movement from psychology to biology in which functional imaging uh, has played a major role. Prior to it, we had no direct immediate access to the brain except by dissecting um, the brain post-mortem. Advances in technologies and especially brain imaging are tools that confirm the intuitions of Freud, Wernicke, Alzheimer, namely that depression is a circuit disorder, a brain choreography involving not one area but multiple areas, a pattern, uh, a network. The network approach represents a paradigm shift in understanding mental condi conditions. Phrenology is finally transcended. As a matter um, of fact, it confirms uh, y Jasper's intuition that no direct one-on-one -on -one correspondences can be made between mental states and bra brain areas. 
The ringleader uh, in this neuro circuit responsible for depression uh, is area 25. Uh, in the frontal lobe, the negative uh, mood uh, regulator. The other centers of this network, amygdala, uh, the stimulus enforcement, learning, and stress regulator. Hypothalamus, uh, the regulator of dry sleep, appetite, libido. Hippocampus, memory regulator, insula, uh, internal awareness, uh, prefrontal cortex, uh, which is m even more complex. A therapeutic of depression must restore the functional integrity of all the centers of this network, a very tall uh, ambition and uh, project. Since the effects of treatment can be observed through imaging, treatment can be readjusted accordingly. However, therapeutics is no longer subordinated to somatic prejudice. On the contrary, it includes medication and deep uh, brain stimulation of area 25, side by side with psychotherapy, together uh, or separately adapted to specific cases. Perhaps the integrative vision that may confirm the validity of Jasper's dualism, as well as of Henri's subjective body, immanentism, is also the result of growing skepticism about unilateral treatment, somatic or psychic. Eric Kendall notes the presence of public perception of the inefficacy of antidepressants, believed to have a placebo effect, as well as of psychoanalysis, which has been out of favor for a while now. Interestingly, the velocity of contemporary advances in technological assessment of brain, especially brain imaging, imposes fast-paced readjustment not only in treatment but also in self-understanding. According to experts joining the debates from different domains, brain imaging, pharmacology, and psychotherapy together provide the conditions for the possibility of understanding and living through and with depression. Peter Wybro insists, without self-understanding, that genetically prone to depression, once the first episode is triggered by a life event, will not be capable of responding to treatment. Subjectivity and philosophy cannot be eliminated from the equation of self-care by any theological advances. Now, this is a humanist and generous view, uh, one that confirms both Jaspers and Aries. Would then a step further uh, into design analysis be warranted in today's psychiatry? And if so, what, what would be the, uh, how would it be uh, accepted? The idea that pathos um, is, uh, or suffering uh, is, uh, is good for you. Uh, that uh, pathos uh, has a value, uh, how would that be um, viewed in, in treatment? Um, so Jaspers extracts the uh, existential meaning. Uh, am, am, I, am I going? Uh, Jaspers uh, extracts the existential meaning of clinical data and articulates the design analysis in uh, part six. The existential evidence gathered in uh, Heidelberg uh, is put to use in his concluding philosophical reflections on the nature of being human and the value of limi liminal situations for authentic existence. The shattering in angst is certainly such a limit and a cipher. The reality of human incompleteness must be taken into account, for essence of man is the incompleteness of his being. For a being defined uh, for, by incompleteness, sickness must be an ontological condition. And to provoke the psychological event that, uh, that causes uh, a descent into the abyss of anxiety is a task of uh, pedagogical love. Jaspers acknowledges uh, that his uh, stance is grounded in but goes beyond clinical psychiatry. <laughs> um, and uh, there was a long uh, quote, uh, which I leave now. Uh, existential anxiety is a condition for freedom, according to 
uh, his uh, philosophical understanding and must be cultivated by the human individual whose uh, horizon of being is the actualization of existence. For Jaspers, as for all philosophers of life, the beginning of authentic existence originates in angst. It is only through confrontation with the limit situation of psychic pathos that the individual reaches deep uh, sources of existence, thus of creativity. So um, what is today's answer um, of sufferer and psychiatrist, public and scientists, to this kind of claims uh, that freedom and creativity are grounded in the abyss of anxiety, that melancholy is a creative response of the three egos, that subjective immanentism uh, is always pathetic, and more importantly, what does this answer reveal about late modernity, global, uh, apocalyptic, and singular uh, modernity? <laughs> Thanks, Elena. And uh, you know, I, I, I liked your your beginning and ending uh, with, and not that I didn't like in the middle, but but that you began with empathy and ended with with. You know, with suffering and, and, and pain, you know, and and you know, as as as, as the maven of melancholy, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think that, that that's uh, that's appropriate. We started yesterday with empathy, right, and this sense of uh, how we share fellow feeling, you know, in the presence of the pain of another, and uh, the empathic approach of psychopathology. You know, is basically an intersubjective kind of kind of a, of, of a process, right? So, um, it puts me in mind of, a, of, of, of something that, that, that I heard when I was at a conference I had absolutely no right to be at, <laughs> uh, of the Jewish Science and Medicine Group. You know, being an Irish Catholic economist, <laughs> but it was this group. But 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 it was but it was this group that got me there actually. <laughs> yes. So so what I heard there, you know, about current clinical practice, not only in uh, uh, psychiatry and psychology, but in all in all forms of medicine, is the the thrust to treat the person, not the symptoms to treat the, the person, not the symptoms. And this leads me to suspect that something both you and uh, uh, Andy seem to suggest that part six of, of the general psychopathology, you know, is almost casting into new territory um, because the first five parts are, 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 are in, in, in the clinical project. But I think it's not, and, I, and, I, and this is what I want you to, 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 to respond to. Um, in the first five parts, you've got two forms of disease. You've got the form of disease that is the disintegration of, of the existence, right, of the person. And the second form of disease is the disassociation of the person from reality, from the encompassing world. And I think that part six is saying the therapy for those two forms of disease are to have the integration of the encompassing that, that I am and then the encompassing that the world is become part of, of my cure, right? Part of my, my uh, uh, recognition. So, uh, you know, particularly, uh, Alina, as, as you think of melancholy, do you think that that kind of reintegration of self and reconnection with world is, uh, is the therapeutic that Jaspers is talking about? How, how do how do you we distinguish between uh, a melancholy that is uh, a matter of uh, you know, uh, an existential condition 
um, and the, um, a melancholy that is already a pathological condition. Uh, so while it may be true that the integration uh, is what is needed and uh, desired as the uh, goal of therapy, uh, how would that integration take place in, in therapy? That, that remains a, a question. Um, I, I was uh, watching uh, this uh, a panel of uh, um, to which uh, of discussion of melancholy in the brain series uh, with uh, Charlie Rose and <laughs> and uh, Andrew um, Solomon was invited um, as a, as a sufferer uh, from melancholy and uh, and also a writer and uh, psych psychologist. So um, he uh, would understand uh, all these concerns, uh, but he would also uh, claim that it, it would ha he, he needed therapy in order to uh, effectuate this reintegration. So he clearly needed more than um, me medication, and I, I don't know if he was referring to other kind of therapies. Uh, I mean, um, um, perhaps uh, uh, electroconvulsive therapy or uh, something else. But uh, beyond, uh, yes, in parallel with uh, the um, sci psychological uh, treatment. So um, if, if that is the case, that, that's why in, uh, in my study I tried to stay away from the pathological. Uh, because uh, entering there, uh, you know, you, you have to bring the, the individual to a, a place of um, uh, capability to, to think and to function. Uh, and only uh, in parallel, uh, as I said, with, uh, uh, with uh, talk treatment <laughs> or uh, psychotherapy, uh, or uh, at some point. That's true. Um, but the, the dualism would remain, <laughs> in other words. So you, you, you need both to treat uh, um, Im immediately, in some cases, the body, uh, the biological, and uh, in parallel. So th th there is a sense of dualism, even if uh, ultimately the, the being itself is not uh, split, is not cut off in two. Uh, but uh, the, the two orders are so uh, heterogeneous or so different at, at their extremes that you need uh, different kinds of treatment. But I am not, uh, I don't want to enter uh, that ground uh, of uh, therapeutic uh, uh, on my own. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, uh, look. Oh. A very quick uh, uh, question. Uh, I don't know if I uh, got it right, uh, what, uh, what you said, but I was uh, uh, particularly interested in the passage where uh, you say that uh, uh, in a situation where, uh, for example, we are confronted with uh, psychotic symptoms and uh, uh, empathy uh, or genetic understanding fails. Uh, if, if I understand well f from your talk, I got the impression that somehow Jasper's view, view would be that uh, uh, somehow uh, resorting to explaining would be uh, a, a wrong uh, uh, approach. Uh, I don't know if I got it right, but in fact, uh, from what I've, uh, from my understanding of Jaspers, I would say that uh, uh, his uh, uh, view that uh, when uh, uh, we are confronted uh, uh, with uh, um, this un understandability would exactly be where there is a sign of a biological process, as he called it, and as Kurt, Kurt Schneider, after him in his uh, psychiatric school, uh, called it, uh, and uh, that, that, that therefore it, it, it would uh, uh, probably be uh, warranted to uh, have uh, also that perspective. Obviously, that wouldn't mean that uh, uh, a person obviously, obviously cannot be reduced uh, to uh, his, uh, his brain. Uh, but uh, um, I would say that, that uh, in, uh, in, uh, in his view, uh, uh, the, in, that particular, uh, in, in that particular moment, uh, a biological perspective would be a, a valid approach uh, within uh, the epistemological uh, limits uh, of, uh, of that approach. Thank you for the question. Um, I, I'm not sure I, I understood. I, I think Jasper's, for me, uh, is not clear here. Uh, because uh, that, that was the, the main problem, the main question. How do you uh, empathize? How do you get to an understanding of, uh, of um, uh, schizophrenic delusion? 
uh, can you still uh, claim or can you still try to empathize and uh, and what would that mean so uh, so that that was the uh, non understandable how, how do you when you reach that uh, a state uh, what do you do and it seems that uh, jaspers would uh, still would continue to to claim that uh, uh, empathy is the way and uh, that resorting to something else uh, would distort or even if you do then uh, you have to integrate uh, them in the whole uh, picture, uh, but but that is not not clear. Perhaps some somebody else uh, can help me here. Could I render an opinion on that? <laughs> I, I think that there actually are grounds for thinking that in cases of the ununderstandable, the Aspers might um, veer towards a biological explanation. Um, certainly, it's those cases that are not going to respond to talk therapy. And I, I mean, we know so much more about the brain now. We know so much more about practical interactions between drugs and brain and, uh, you know, other modalities than he did that I, I don't think we can really speak intelligently about what <clears throat> he would say today with the knowledge that, you know, he didn't have then. But certainly, uh, I think your interpretation, uh, th there's some grounds to it, I would say. Well, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure be because, uh, <laughs> because that, that was the, the problem, the non-understandable. Uh, uh, he, uh, he claims that the biological or the um, therapist is jumping, uh, in makes a leap into the biological when they hit the non-understandable. Now, um, wherever it is, right? So um, that that would be not warranted because that simplifies everything. And, and it seems to clarify everything, but it does not. So that's why uh, I'm saying that al although he uh, approved or um, the a biological uh, explanation, but uh, not especially not in those cases, and, and uh, when looking at the schizophrenia, uh, the delusional schizophrenia, uh, he's even, he seems to be uh, considering the possibility that uh, the sufferer um, encounters uh, um, a valid uh, um, e world uh, and experiences something uh, inaccessible to everybody. So um, resorting to the biological would simply uh, annul that world. You know. uh, I think that an his uh, historical perspective also I think that uh, coming back to your introduction, a historical perspective would uh, would help in that. And uh, I think that uh, uh, what I understand of that is when uh, he talks of uh, uh, process and he talks of a biological basis, what he's uh, uh, referring to is the work that uh, uh, led uh, uh, to uh, discovering the basis for progressive paralysis that happened uh, uh, during the, the years of the when he were tr was training or slightly before the, what uh, was happening for studying Alzheimer's disease. So I think that historically, when he talks about process uh, and he talks about uh, some uh, a biological uh, something biological that is happening, I would imagine that uh, that is what he's re referring to. But I might be wrong here. So my paper is about the dynamics of the self in phenomenology as related to the self-no-self -self debates in neuroscience today. Uh, contemporary neuroscience, as any other science, develops its various research areas at different pace. The brain activity corresponding to memory um, accumulation and loss visual recognition, cognitive operations, emotions are more studied than awareness, self-awareness, consciousness, the self. Uh, and uh, as uh, two leading uh, specialists in the field mentioned, neuroscience of self is, and self-consciousness is in its very infancy. Moreover, Neuroscience does not use just one uniformed concept of self. 
Patricia uh, Churchland made an attempt to express emotions and consciousness in terms of brain activity, movement of impulse along uh, neurons, uh, neurons lines. Uh, but Antonia Damasio stands for the proto-self, core self, or core consciousness, which play some kind of meta-control function in the brain activity involved in perception. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, scientific research in the area of consciousness, consciousness and self-consciousness advances slowly might be a conceptual confusion about the self, its profiles and its functioning in the whole sphere of personality. In other words, Different scientists understand something different under the same categories related to the self. Hence, preliminary conceptual disambiguation of these notions is very much uh, needed both for the further scientific progress in the field and deeper philosophical understanding of realities behind those notions. Uh, however, one should avoid traditional line of criticism of scientific reductionism, reductionism in the analysis of consciousness and self, like uh, Colin McGean demonstrates in, in the uh, recent article in New York Review of Books. If we do not see profound novelty of the most recent scientific data related to the brain functioning and keep on talking that the consciousness cannot be played down to a chemical uh, reactions in neurons and keep on opposing it a unique conscious substance or entity, we do not help ourselves in a metaphysical way either. After all, Precisely giving up Aristotelian notion of form, that is welcoming a reductionist approach in description of natural phenomena, led to the intellectual activity which we call science today. What includes, con uh, what includes conducting research, formulating hypotheses, and performing experiments. Uh, fortunately, in phenomenology, such procedures uh, such procedure is not simply a, a preliminary operations, but constitutes a full-scale legitimate philosophizing, uh, which intends to clarify necessary conditions for the meaning of concepts in questions. Phenomenology would fit the task because it treats consciousness the way it deserves, in my opinion. Uh, first, uh, why is it so? Uh, it exercises such an approach to consciousness which does not reduce it to something which is not consciousness, mental states, linguistic structures, cultural archetypic mentality, religious entities, statistical experimental data or MRI measurements of activity of human brain. Second, it also allows dealing with consciousness as phenomena, that is something which discloses itself in itself, by itself and for itself, without building the next level of observation, and ad, vin ad, and ad infinitum, without end, you know, we cannot stop anyway. It allows uh, a, phenomenolo a phenomenologist to mark and deal with consciousness on the same level he or she performs a conscious act. He or she does not need to go up to the next level to observe it is an, an, as an object. Uh, it, it is observable from inside. If I perceive something, I see something, and at the same time, I immediately become aware of me perceiving it. Consciousness is uh, intrinsically intimating, self-revealing, Autoreferential and phenomenology recognizes these qualities and tries to make them explicit. Third, it makes it possible for consciousness to be observable, uh, but not to be a material substance produced by brain or other tiny gland in human body or spiritual entity 
dispense it in, into individual minds to be marked as the object of analysis. Uh, Jasper's concept of the transcendental comes up very handy here. Consciousness, though it is not identical with the transcendental, but very similar in, in one aspect. It is all what is beyond any thingness. And if it leads to some kind of out of the world object, it is what Jaspers calls false transcendence. A true transcendence is always on the border between the object and non-object. So I move to the next chapter. It is self-consciousness and self-consciousness. First, in uh, traditional Western metaphysics and humanities, uh, Western philosophy has been always uh, busy with uh, formulating more and more conceptual models uh, to unfold the conscious self, the entity, substance, operator of the mind, manifestation, instances, instantiation, uh, articulation, or marking of consciousness. Theoretical foundation of all humanities in the West is, uh, is made of concepts which are located in the self. Economics, perception, um, emotions, perceptions, sensations, free will, high cognitive operations, discourse and reasoning, imagination, identity, memory, artistic creativity, religious faith, moral and legal responsibility, social and political behavior. In all these areas of human involvement, self is the substance or entity central to any experience culturally shaped, psychologically multi-layered, and religiously reinforced. But it is not clear what self is, whether it is a spontaneous source of all human cognition and, uh, cognition and, uh, and actions, uh, the result of the very same cogni uh, cognitive act, uh, acts and actions, or both. Uh, on the other side, on the other hand, there, uh, there is a different metaphysics which developed an opposite view of the self as, uh, its rela uh, its, uh, and its relation to consciousness. Consciousness is viewed not in spontaneous pulsating activity of the self or manifestation of the universal uh, personal mind in finite personal mind. It is awareness of all sorts. Uh, of object and people in the world, as well as sensing, feeling, and cognizing person. Buddhism uh, rejects self as a focal point of reference and uh, knowledge about consciousness. It is viewed as an illusion resulting from production on ha of habitual waves of life upon consciousness. The self, Buddhist claim, is uh, mistakenly becomes identified with the sequence of experiences held together and presented as a story. That is, the self is thought to be a narrator, assumed to be the same, uh, uh, the same in multiple experiences. However, special meditative technique developed in Buddhism lead, uh, leads to experience of awareness, which is which is present but hidden in any mental act, be it in sensation, perception, imaging, memory, uh, or, uh, and rational discourse. The technique would not simply objectify, objectify mental states, that is, consider them as object of the higher witnessing, witnessing or monitoring self. It allows extracting awareness as experience without destroying it in, in infinite regre uh, regress of observation. It makes it possible for consciousness to expand and elucidate both consciousness as the ag agent of cognitive acts and consciousness as awareness of them. Of them. Not only Buddhists reject itself as an illusion, an obstacle on the way of reflective examination of consciousness. Other Indian philosophical school, Advaita Vedanta for one, also claimed that though consciousness is reflexive and self-illuminating, it does not yield reality of self because it does not generate self as endured 
and standing on its own. Uh, some Western philosophers also take a position of stripping the self of its independent and unique ontological status and characterize the reality in terms of contingency, operational bundle of experience, or experiential, experiential self. For the whole spectrum of these views, you can see the book, Self No Self, Perspective from Analytic, Phenomenological, and Indian Tradition, just recently pub published a couple of years ago. But the issue persists whether consciousness is self-reflective, reveals itself, points to itself, and illuminates itself in any cognitive act without generating the phenomenon which we call self, or consciousness which presupposes subjectivity would necessarily lead to the subject as, it, as its major modes of appearance, which is given in experience um, uh, is uh, something I, I made a mistake here, I don't know. <laughs> um, what is given in experience? Yeah, what is given in experience is given through I, through me, uh, as appeared through the first person participation. Uh, and modus operandi, uh, operandi as an enduring center of narration in changing the experience and ultimately constitu uh, constitute the invariant self. In phenomenology, uh, uh, how it is in phenomenology? Phenomenology seems to be capable to navigate between substantialization of the self in Western metaphysics ontological neutralization of self in Buddhism and rejection of a self in some contemporary neuroscience, uh, uh, by some contemporary neuroscientists. Phenomenology starts uh, not with the concept of consciousness, but experience in various cognitive acts, perception, sensation, memory, fantasy, etc., performed by a particular person. Any act does not only present an object, but contains a tacit reference to the pre-reflective subject interwoven into the act. Thematized in reflection, the acts reveal high active agents, um, highly active agents of the experience, constituting the meaning of both what is given, the object, and how it is given, the subject. For our purposes, uh, the explicating of self, we, call, we focus on the act pole of the experience. Uh, constitutive um, elements of the perception are spacious, uh, spacious and temporal. Constitutive elements of the sensation and impressions, which do not generate the meaning of a physical uh, object, are temporal. Within consciousness, uh, time, temporal position of the event is what is earlier, that is what is earlier and what is later, is the only mechanism of, to differentiate between variant, various occurrences. If one wants to move further in description of constitutive elements of the meaning of any act of consciousness, was one must uh, to understand how meaning of time is constituted. In, um, in analyzing consciousness, we come to the level on which consciousness and time are inseparable. According to Husserl, there are four levels on which the meaning of time is constituted the objective flow of time, imminent time, internal time, and a temporal full flow of consciousness. Uh, the first one, at the first level, the objective flow of time is suspended by Husserl in epoche in order to clarify subjective conditions for formation or constitution of the objective flow of consciousness from the future, uh, 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 flow of time from the future to the uh, past, and we do not consider it because we are on the side of the object, not on the side uh, on the side of the object, not on the side of the. Uh, uh, we are on the side of the subject, not on the side of the object. So the objective time is uh, suspended. 
uh, imminent time within which temporal differentiations are constituted in the context of the immediate experience of consciousness, impressions, and sensations. Those acts of consciousness which do not have a correlate in the objective, in the other world, they're inside, impressions and sensations. Awareness of continuity and succession is on display to shape the meaning of the most elementary forms of consciousness. Uh, Husserl uses the metaphor of um, uh, musical tone. Uh, uh, the sensation of the succession is not the result of the succession of the notes. Uh, so if we have only one cessation after another, we actually do not have sensation of the succession. Those notes should be taken together uh, in order to hear a melody as harmonious whole, but not as a row of momentary non-connected sounds. It is crucial to let the sound move totally out of the consciousness and retain it not let the sound move totally out of consciousness and, and retain somehow so that the following sound can be preserved as connected with the first. The temporal gene is uh, the unified whole of three phases of any experience of consciousness. The past, just past, the actual impression and just uh, just about to be, just about to happen. So this is the this is how we experience time, not as um, as uh, separated moments, but uh, the uh, events. And the events have, um, uh, and, and we have the ability to perceive it, you know, to grasp it uh, uh, as a continue as a continuously changing mode of givenness, uh, which presupposes the. The, impre the primordial impression uh, and uh, just has been faced and just about to happen together. The presence, uh, the presence of the present is stained with two absences, in, uh, and Husserl called them retention and pretension, the past and the future. Uh, in my opinion, the metaphor of musical note used by Husserl to introduce retention of the actual fa phase of impression as modified in the following phases is crucial. It helps to clarify how reflexivity of consciousness is possible. Retention of the primary uh, memory, retention or the primary memory, uh, Husserl called it the primary memory, is what just has been is spontaneous, not conscious, not intentional occurrence of consciousness. It is intrinsically linked with the actual phase of perception or sensation, and it takes place in the present. This is how consciousness is capable to preserve and show itself. That is, express its reflectivity and self-awareness on the same level on which any act of consciousness takes place. Uh, uh, the third level, internal, internal time consciousness, uh, consciousness is responsible for constitution of all acts of consciousness which we have in, in triple matrix. Impression, uh, uh, in the context of retention, in, impression in the context of retention and pretension. Pure consciousness is consciousness which retains all its acts. Nothing is fading out of both sides of intentional consciousness. They all are acts of consciousness. Uh, what we have here uh, uh, is that consciousness constitutes itself. Uh, constitution is the, uh, how the object takes place in the act of consciousness, but in the, in the field of consciousness, the act and the object are the same. That's why, that's, that's why it is, uh, 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 consciousness reproduces itself in acts. The intent and content in the act of, con is the act of consciousness itself. And it doesn't have to have the first impulses, something from the outside. 
this is it it pulsates and it um, uh, it it um, uh, it happens to be in instances and these instances uh, they are just consciousness they are empty they are they are what Kant would call transcendental presupposition for any perception or any sensation or any memory uh, later on. Within the sphere of consciousness, the object pole, the sensation, perception, fantasies, etc., and the subject pole, intentions and simple perceptions are the same. Consciousness creates its own possibility as empty acts of consciousness. Uh, uh, I wouldn't go to the fourth uh, level <coughs> because it's, uh, it's slightly different, so I just skip it. Uh, uh, the, uh, the sense of awareness, tacit uh, reference to the subject, self-revealant flow of consciousness, all these categories are based in phenomenology on the capacity of flow of consciousness to partially preserve itself in every uh, actual phase of its own passing away. And it uh, and it doing so genu and it is doing so uh, it generates its own reflective occurrence. Uh, clearly, there are uh, at least two directions in which the subject and potential self are uh, constituted as the meaning on, in phenomenology: the subject, a potential proto or minimal self. Uh, appears to be invariant in all acts of consciousness. And the self as acquired or gained narrative in intersubjective relationship and within the uh, life world, the next stage in, in phenomenology. Phenomenology can preserve as a methodological guide for any study, um, can serve as, as a methodological guide in any study of consciousness uh, by science. It provides the meaningful context for such a notion as a proto self, minimal self, narrative self, invariant self, spontaneous self, lost self, split self, layered self. However, philosophically, the most interesting and the most challenging approach to self proceeds from the fact that uh, starting from the uh, very early age, humans have the direct intuition of their own enduring and continuous selves, the most immediate awareness of themselves as distinct from um, other humans and all other reality in the world though they sense other conscious beings as well. But even when humans develop highly sophisticated ways of attribution and predication and can recognize, identify, and express themselves in artistic language the way they are and how and they uh, know themselves for themselves is a direct, non-verbal, non-discursive, self-referential awareness, me is me. In this way, a human being is, is inborn mystic. He or she is, uh, and he or she knows what it means to be, and this, and this is perhaps the source of the sense of reality, which later becomes a criterion for all other reality, realities he or she encounters in life. A human has a direct access to reality and knows about reality because human is real to himself or herself and he or she knows about it. Consciousness given as a self is the only phenomenon that can uh, accomplish uh, both, uh, that can accomplish both reality and awareness that um, uh, uh, at a single instance of its own occurrence. So I am very much blessed and consciousness, self-consciousness, and it is something which was probably a topic of my practice and research for many years, which called depersonalization. So it means a disorder of self-consciousness, disorder of self-awareness. And I would very much appreciate... Mental disease. 
you can call it, I would say, a phenomenon. I would not go to label. If you wish, you can label. I would avoid. A phenomenon when I do not feel myself as mine and real. I feel myself depersonalized. And this is one of phenomena uh, which we do not aware about it normalcy, so to speak. Like, we, I, I'm sitting, I do not know that I have a kidney, for example. But God forbid I will have something with my kidney, I would have ache and I learn that I do have it. So that's one of the mental phenomena, psychic phenomena, just a phenomenon of human life, which comes when it is, is it, yes, then I feel, oh, everything which I experience is actually mine and real. And now I just do not feel myself mine or real. And I very much would appreciate, Lida, if you will tell, based on what you presented, your understanding of consciousness and self-consciousness. And I like this very much, that between act of consciousness and object, there is no difference. That it's a kind of oneness. How would you understand this depersonalization, or how depersonalization could be understood in your, um, in a frame well, of your presentation? Well, I would, uh, okay. I would call it mental disorder. And, uh, uh, and what, um, um, uh, the reason why uh, psychiatry is very important for philosophy, uh, is that through all kinds of disorders, diversions, uh, break, psychological breaks, so consciousness reveals itself. And uh, it's uh, uh, actually my question to you was, you know, what do you call mental disease? You know, like on which level? You know, uh, uh, how do we pinpoint it? It's a disruption of self, disruption of, uh, of uh, um, um, uh, it's not just like uh, two strong reactions to reality, so it destroyed myself. Or it's uh, in, uh, 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 the emotions are so strong and they're so many, so overwhelming that myself is lost. You know, like the my conscious self, the self uh, is not capable of dealing with this. And we have, uh, like, um, uh, uh, what um, uh, and 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 and, uh, and actually uh, very uh, common phenomena in back in in the Soviet Union, uh, overwhelmed people drinking. You know, this is, it's one of the way to deal with over over overwhelmed psychological conditions. So people cannot deal with it. It's like a, a, a break and circuit break. So it's like, uh, uh, it's better to, uh, to disrupt, to, to call off the whole consciousness, the whole self in order to, uh, not to deal with reality. So I don't, um, 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 that's, uh, I, I really uh, would hear from you uh, concrete examples, how you deal with this. Then uh, I just, I can just, you know, uh, uh, state the fact that uh, uh, it's, it's uh, the mental disease or, mental or, or disorders indicate, um, uh, or lose of the self indicate uh, uh, something very important uh, uh, about consciousness and about uh, 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 about self. So, yeah, yeah. No, this. I think, I think there's actually something quite normal about wanting to lose yourself. Not that I'm recommending it, but uh, I mean, we see it in normal public behavior at, at, at sports stadiums and mobs, crowds, uh, people reacting in a completely, really selfless way, uh, being taken over by 
mass hysteria. We see it in other cultures, uh, even more so maybe, and <clears throat> we see it in mystical phenomena where the, uh, the, the lover of God wants to completely obliterate his or herself in the uh, in God, it, it's not it's not so psychopathological uh, as you might think. But uh, again, it's not. I'm not saying that it's good, <laughs> but uh, it might be within the realm of the normal. Well, you know, if you consider any creative personality normal. Yeah, well, it is within the uh, with their but 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 uh, many uh, psychiatrists would say that creative personality is mostly abnormal, and 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 <laughs> and uh, um, uh, so if you uh, talk to an artist, uh, they actually welcome the uh, sensation and conditions when they lose themselves and something goes through them and uh, something moves with their brush and uh, they, they do not belong to themselves. Something higher, more profound, more so. It's uh, 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 talking to them, through them. It, uh, in religious experience, it happens all the time. So. Hello. Um, I'm wondering if you're familiar with uh, Francisco Varello's work in which he uses Husserl and um, he's actually tracked through the brain uh, various levels of um, timing uh, for neuronal firing in the brain. And he actually says that uh, Husserl's way of, of discussing those levels is useful for discussing these things. And he says there's one level that's what he calls retentional consciousness, which is the level of the brain waves, which is the level of language and the level of consciousness of um, you know, articulate consciousness and perceptual consciousness. And then there's a lower level, which is the level of the immediate nowness. And then he also says that there's a base level that is kind of what uh, you know, uh, Asian philosophers would call uh, sleep without dreams. So Francisco Varela has a very interesting, you know, parallel to what Husserl says well, about these things. What what strikes me is the uh, the difference between uh, a a psychiatric or a uh, neurological approach to problems of consciousness and uh, problems of health and disease on the one hand and the philosophical approach. Now, it seems to me that uh, philosophical approaches have been, have been uh, uh, produced on the basis of, of the dominant philosophical approaches to the self, namely, it seems to be uh, the, the concept of the self arises in the early modern times in the, uh, as an attempt to, to come to grips from the Christian point of view with problems of responsibility. So there's a moral origin. And in, in modern times, in people like Montaigne and Descartes, this is transformed into a uh, an epistemological approach. Now, that that approach uh, is uh, dependent on the idea of knowledge of a certain kind, which has nothing to do with uh, human experience. In my view, it has to do with uh, claims for apodicticity, and uh, it's related in different ways, which are complicated, and I need not explain here to uh, very early ancient Greek uh, approaches to knowledge based on the, uh, on the attempt to know uh, the mind independent real as it is. Now, this leads in modern times to uh, so-called metaphysical realism and so on. Uh, what, what strikes me in the kinds of approaches that you people are featuring, uh, the approach to the self uh, is coeval with the with the objects, so that so that both the subject and the object emerge at the same time. 
so that one doesn't deal one, what, whatever the whatever the notion of the subjectivity is that one deals with is subjectivity within a pragmatic perspective, as opposed to some kind of presupposed notion of uh, knowledge and so on.